therapist. Two weeks later, I had their truck and they were fine. So, I know you're busy right now. Yeah, I'm getting to know. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. I wish I could get my wife. Here we go. Hey, we just went live so they can hear everything we're saying. We are we just went live just now. Okay, I'm gonna give you a but thank you, Jason. Let's go. You're alive. Okay. You guys be Thank <laughs> you. 
We have Cheryl and Maurice, they're also part of the arcade team. Uh, and last but not least, I better mention you for all of your favor from my dad right there. <laughs> Okay, you can take it or leave it. I'll 
ask if anyone wants to give any questions in at the end, but this is what I'm going to propose. Okay. <laughs> so something's going on, and it's super duper weird, guys. So what is it? What is all of the strangeness about? All of the things that started in 2020, and where we are now at this point. You know, the country I come from, Britain, it's got the shit in the handbag. It's like a really weird dystopian uh, experience. I can't even stand living in it. It's like all my worst nightmares as a child, growing up reading 1984. It's gone way past that. It's like because everyone is in this mind control state. I, I don't, you know, it is so difficult. I'm right? sure those of you experienced the same in the last two years. So what's going on? Okay, the sun is going on. <laughs> It's definitely changing, guys. There's something afoot with the sun. They know about it, maybe telling us about it for years through history and through contemporary music. They are definitely telling us what is going on. And is this the battery's running out? The battery, the sun. I'll get to this now. So, the sun used to be yellow in my youth. Uh, like a sodium light, and now it's LED because the construct needs to conserve energy, so it's sort of switched to an LED because it's losing its energy. Now, if you think of the sun, you know, whatever you think of it as a fiery plasma ball in space, it doesn't matter. What I'm going to propose links it to a lot of discoveries that have come out in the alternative history fields. And it is that the sun is based on the fat shapes. It is when you look into it, if you have done circulating, you literally witness the flower of life. What you're doing is you're witnessing down a fat shape, and you're seeing the end of it. Sure. Okay, you'll see the end of it. And then the individual rods cores inside this. Think of it in terms of fiber optic cable. Now, this fiber optic cable, the fascia is the sun, is losing its strength. It's happened before and it happened again. Now, when a battery loses power, <coughs> it needs to be recharged. And when this recharging process actually happens, you get mud in the bottom of the battery, like the mud blood. Now, there's a type of, oh, excuse me, I'm going to pay for work. There's a lot of type of holography out there, which you do not need a photographic image, but it will show you three-dimensional objects. Now, if you could just think, now I'm actually flat over, so I actually think there's a dome for us. Okay. Whatever the shape of this realm is, you can think of it in simulation, this actually works in that. So if you imagine that the dome is the splitter mirrors for holography, and that the sun is holographically projecting our reality and splitting it through the dome. And this is the experience we are experiencing here right now. Our souls exist in the fascias, in the chords. We're connected through, like, if you see Johnny, Johnny Darko, the, the silver umbilical cord. We are connected. This is why when you stare in the sun, you get rejuvenated, you get energized. They definitely know about it. You know, in the past, some worship was forbidden amongst the common folk. It was only kept the elite. The Egyptians, with the surfaces, they certainly know about it. If you look at their iconography, you can see lots of um, cartouches that actually show uh, what looks like a holographic reality being projected from the sun. So, how do you recharge the battery? Well, you need to reset. Need to reset and to top the battery up, and this is the cycle that's going on. Okay, the sun loses its strength. The evidence that uh, we picked up is all the people have missing in the past, guys. The skirt, the sun will turn the sky a vanilla color. We witnessed it in the past. Everybody goes missing around the 1850s. Then the place gets repopulated with people who look really anemic and they just come out of nowhere. Show sure, lots of people about the open trains. And then they repopulate this place. Dug up the of the birds after the last battery change. It is 
code it. It's the cachets of this place is to be reset and charge the batteries again. The power source is us, it's our souls, our eternal souls that never die and will live forever. So, when is this going to happen? Well, Jason RK8 has worked out chronology in version 38, sort of fits in with something I like thinking about with the resets. Um, are there any questions about this? Anybody? The fasces, um, well, in ancient times, it was thought of as to be a weapon or just execution stuff. But we decoded it, there was a load of rods put together and energized and became an acoustic weapon with other, side, other types of this technology. Uh, organs, church organs, and pipes put together. I've always found to say the human eye works the same as the fasces. It has the same rotting, it has all these cords that come out of the back, and a coincidentally, if you look at the same construct as the eye, the sun. Now, that could be the case that the fasces itself at the back has cords coming out of the back to the source, whatever it is, the architect. Which sort of suggests that we are AI. Is what it suggests. So, like some sort of troll experience in a holographic reality. You know, there's so much evidence that, you know, this, I don't know if any of you have had any supernatural experiences, things that you're not supposed to, experience things you're not supposed to, synchronicities that make no sense. There's no such thing as coincidences, guys. Deja vu, and when I'm not increasing, what's the washing green state like? All of this means something, and we all know there's a spiritual awakening coming on. You know, it's accelerating, and as it's accelerating, we're getting more and more truths. Yeah, this is the unveiling, this is the nature of a reset. <laughs> you know, maybe this maybe we could spill a tree which I would you, you know, we could turn this place around, which is a fear based society because everyone's watching the telly, it's getting dead by one thing or another, and turn it around to a place of love and of vibration, which has changed, and then that is all the realm in place. You know, these by G towers, but they really mess the place up, guys, and they're really a hazardous electromagnetic technology. But really, I go to work and find people they put them up. And I see them digging those from cables with fiber optic cables. Would they be for telephones? Or are they something else? Could they be playing for time? Now, at Ticklotech, the technology of resonance from free energy, we talk about on my channel, all of the uh, Antiquotech movement, could have been an attempt to hold the realm in place in the past. It's a similar technology, electromagnetic frequency technology, as was supposed to happen with these bat, bat towers, spiky towers. Could it be possible that they're trying to sustain the construct a little bit longer? You know, they, this bullshit that just went on two years ago, um, that was just a practice run to see if they could control the, the masses and just all of them about, make them stay in, make them jump on one net, make them stick their hands in the fire. And lots and lots of did it. Showed their true colours, but you know, they live to pay for that. Yeah. So I think it's a practice run. I think it's a practice run to see how quickly they can control an entire realm of people, which you just think, guys, you can't even make that shit up. You know, could you ever think of it at the time? Is this even happening? What? Everyone in the world saying, yeah, okay, we're not going to work tomorrow, we're just taking their own hands. It's when we trust that. It's really weird to me that there's something else going on. It's a massive process, something I missed. Yes. Yeah, it was just too weird. It was like a from the body snatch. It's still going on, guys. Yeah? Nothing terrible, shit. So, I definitely think it's a battery change. I definitely think that that's still up there. I think the sun, the sun of God, so I think that they touch right the way down the line. So that, and it really does look like a projector, guys. If you have to so, so, so gaze and it turns magenta and it comes through with waveforms and you know it absorbs the light, you 
If you're energised, just there's a theory because there's no more toilets in the town with that. That's why I'm quite up and up into the toilet. There are 40, 100 rooms in Versailles, one toilet for Louis the Sixteenth. Where's everyone going? So, there's something, yeah, there's something going on with that. So, people have talked the idea of preparing this own. I'm not completely sold on whether or not you can energise yourself just from breathing, but definitely. You get energised from staying in the sun in the morning at a low uh, horizon and when it's setting as well. It really does energise. I think all of these mystics go about it. I think, you know, when they want to do some deeper thinking and understanding, they should go to the mountains. Now, I experienced something, we went to 10,000 feet. Could I even breathe? But I noticed something different when I came down from the mountains. I felt like Superman. It's like, this shit's really easy after you get there. Really. So I think you know mystics, that's why they always go to the mountains. These people, you know, shamanic types, shaman, they get into higher elevations for clear thinking. And then they come to act up to sea level in their conclusions. So that's what I think. You know, my study of reset, this is a definite, they definitely reset the civilization, guys. And it seems that we're locked in a small increment of time. And if we, you know, if we look up at that window of time, all we see is destruction and reset. And I'm not sure how many of this be, guys, but you know, I, you know, our place in this is also powerful. You know, they just hijack consciousness where they really is all about us, guys. You know, we're the most powerful, powerful of an entity. You can even imagine. And they've locked us down. You know, we've got a limited potential. We can do everything. We can be Superman and Superwoman. Matrix still is a documentary. It shows you what you can be once you unlock them from that fake ass reality that they sold us, which bears no resemblance to what reality really is and what our place in it. You know, we should be, we should be blending and working together to get on and you know, creating a, a, a love society where there's no fear. This is the place where we want to live. We want our kids to live. We want them to like gas, live by sight. That's the gender, that does shit not stop, you know? And that's where we come in, you know, the <laughs> But the point is, is I feel personally that it gives me a new zest for life. You know, people are in this death pot and they're petrified. That's what's driving them. They die scared of being alone and they're scared of death. The two, yeah, and it's right. You, so you spend your whole reality scared to not actually living because you're worried about dying, makes you feel like a sense. And the, the cult of like, oh, oh I've got a death based morality, and they have to do like a commemoration because it's a death cult because they want to lock in and plug into that negative energy that they've been hardwired to accept. You know, so people will come home from work and they'll be like, oh, I don't want to watch the television today because it's going to be all bad news, but they'll sit there and they'll be like, no, I don't know, and they'll carry on. Because they're half white to bad information because they're negative entities. Uh, they're through true environmental creation, I believe. I reckon every one of us are born in Ireland, and I reckon after that, when they grab your way into the indoctrination system, it's done from there. But I do believe we're all in life before. And, and I think that this movement is the only resistance there is to this, what's going on, guys. And I think it's up to us to all stand up, captains of our own ships, and sh share it if, if you feel you should share the information. But, you know, let's change this world together, guys, and make it a better place to live. And this is what we're going to do, okay? You all for that? <laughs> So that's my message anyway. This place definitely gets to be sat at this. This sun is doing well. Could be a lot of time, it could be up to fix it, but that's definitely what's going on. Okay? They're using this psyop so they can earn a bit of money marketing or climate change. We don't know that's just bullshit. This is a natural cycle that we can prove. That we prove through antiquity, and we can prove through historical texts, and boots on the ground looking at these buildings that are a lot older. You know, I propose. Five years ago, I think I was one of the first that proposed the Americas will be old world and not the new world. It's just the southern bit got wiped off the face of the earth. And the rest, the northern bit, kind of talking to New York, this is an old world civilization. This is 
A big underground place is just massive. This place has been here way long. And they sold to everybody in the end, and this stuff got just shit out of nowhere in the late 1800s. So the whole world, guys, they are built by my mission of Guinness and Chinese. Also, thanks. She smashed it. They took it down, yeah, they took all the canals in Britain and everywhere else in the world as well. They must have been a lot of Irish. There was. Oh, and they all were wiped out as well, at the same time as all this is happening, which makes zero sense. Yeah, right. So, all the 49ers as well, they've been attributed to building San Francisco. Okay, right. In between digging gold and getting drunk, they were building a massive civilization. Yeah. I get it, I get it. <laughs> so, anyway, that's it for me. If you've got any questions, I'd rather to take a couple before I shift off and get on the show. So, anybody, I don't believe it. Okay, cool enough. Oh, all I know of it is that if you snap back into it, that just like instantly gets you back. You know, I thought actually, I know people uh, that have actually experienced this, but <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't comment on it. I haven't really had an out of body experience at all. And I have had lucid dreaming experiences, which I know is not safe, but uh, I thought that I might have been on the astral realm once, flying around as a beat of light, but it might have been drug related. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 100%. Yeah, all the interviews, it's, it's in the language, a couple of words, a couple of words apart. 
One, one, two, three, four. No, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And you really look at the words, the shape of the words. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's a the same thing with the windows. So that the, how they do it as well. I noticed that when they're doing this, this weird phonetic language, you can hear that in the in it. It's like a certainty. The world over here is from the mountain. The bird. The bird came Yeah, the bird came down. There's a great people on the sea. I don't know about this theology. I'm sure it's going to be. <laughs> No, I don't just completely lost me. I just like totally, my brain just totally collapsed. <laughs> I don't know, it's just like birds and dragons. I don't know, I don't know, it's my point. I was trying to work it all out. It's just not going to be. Tell us, guys, give us a one if you love it. Shiba, Shiba, you're listening. Uh, Shiba. Put a comment in there. How about how do you want to laugh the mic? Look us up, bro. A lot of echo. Oh, Shiba says yes. We're going with Shiba. Okay, okay. so the left of the mic, the left mic is going to be better than that mic. We're going to make the mic. Yeah. Jason sounds good. Okay. We're, we're on it. We're going to stick to this. Uh, you guys can hear this mic? Yeah. Okay. We're trying, we're trying to get our ear on YouTube to hear it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh they say in an echo, but yeah, but it's fucking bouncing off the rooms. Yeah, the echoes in the morning, that's the whole building. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Christopher. Hey, bro. It's all right. You know what? We're just going to use this. We're just going to use this. All right, bro. Uh, one thing I want to add to what I was talking about. I don't think you just mentioned it. I don't, I don't think you mentioned it, but when you were presenting this information to me a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at what happens to the batteries when they die. Yeah. Did you mention that? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did, did y'all catch that? Yeah. The rim does it for the long time. Yeah, man. I was thinking, working on that. Maybe I have to keep this away from it. Yeah, I'm totally take the target. Absolutely. So yeah, it's all. Uh, I was really close to Chris when he originally showed me this data. I couldn't believe it. Uh, because we were already on board with the fact that in a holographic construct, the sun, which is the most difficult thing to look at, is actually a projector. So it blew my mind when he told me, he said, look, man, all this, all this data here about batteries, when batteries die, when batteries explode, they have this red dust residue. And that, that, uh, that totally opened my mind to, find, to do a lot more research on the Phoenix Club. 
and I'll be releasing that soon too because it's just a, it's a whole new level. It's really awesome. But uh, while we mess with this sound, let's take our first break. Let's buy some stuff. Thank <laughs> you. 
right up until the 1930s, my friends. I know it was just hogging like it. They gave literally direct poison. And the battle between the herbalists and the doctors is only coming. Now, I know who has watched my shows knows that my most favorite herbalist in the world is, of course, Mr. Nicholas Kolpina, who is a radical and literally probably one of the saving graces of the entire herbalist profession in knowing about natural herbs. The reason why, back in ye old days in the 1600s, he did something that had never been done before. He was a herbalist, trained as an apothecary, but back then you had the doctors, and then you had the apothecary, and the doctors were the lords of Plan High, who wrote little scribblings on pieces of paper to the south of there, and they, they would tell the apothecary, make up this recipe. They would never tell the apothecary what the recipe was for, ever, and the person would take his little script, over to the apothecary, and it would be made up, and they might make it right, or they might not. Oftentimes they did not. And everything in medicine, literally everything in medicine was written in line. Now the average person, of course, they didn't speak line. So if you got a, a script from your doctor, kind of like in modern days where you can't read the writing anyways, Back then, you wouldn't even be able to discern what it was that the doctor was telling you to take. It would all be written in Latin. Half the apothecaries actually didn't speak Latin either, which kind of made it difficult. But anyways, I digress. What he did, Nicholas Culpepper, being the radical that he was, is he took the entire textbook of medicine that had never been written in anything but Latin, and he translated it into common usage English, and then published it so cheap that any person on the street could afford to go buy it. Got him in a bit of trouble. A lot of trouble. And his book, The English Physician, now unfortunately most people will only find what they now call Nicholas Culpepper's Complete Herb. That is the modern book that you'll find. But those books have been grossly diluted because they take out all the shit that they don't understand. Oh, because he talks about planetary alignments. He talks about what we call the humors, where and when the person got sick, how you would judge, what they should be taking, etc. So that's been whitewashed out of his book. So when you really want to read his books, you need to go back to the original. Now on my website, I have all the literally copies of his original books that are available to download. So if you want a copy, sit. I have a, I have a copy of the Modern Herbal, but it's not the same. Which is kind of like a lot of books nowadays. A lot of these historical books. So I have a massive library. Because like Jason, I kind of have a small addiction to books. Okay, it's a large addiction to books. And we need the old books. The old books are vital. So we see a cycle through history all the time. And the cycle is that if they can erase someone they don't like, a la Nikola Tesla, they will. If they can't erase the person, the person has too big a footprint in history, they will whitewash it. They will spin Dr. the story. So, for example, one of my other favorite historical characters is Dr. John D. Now, if you go look up John D. on almost any website, they will tell you, yeah, he was Elizabeth the first court magician and he did like card tricks and shit. Uh, yeah, not what he did. Not. He was an incredibly important man. And the more you research about John D. and the shit that he did, you will have come to understand how he shaped our world that we live in today. They couldn't take him out of history because obviously his footprint was too big. So what they did is they spin doctorate. So now if you say the name John D to anyone nowadays, 
the, the thing called he was just a quack. He was, you know, gazing into crystal balls and, and just selling stories. That's what they do. Nicholas Culpepper was much the same. Most people don't know this. The second most continuous printed book in the world, next to the King James Version Bible, is Nicholas Culpepper's English position. It has never been out of print since 1643. Not once. It has been continuously in print. So next to the King James Bible, his book. But they erased him from history. When you actually go to look up, he said, we know he's been arrested. He was arrested multiple times. We know he went to prison at one point. We don't know what the charges were. They've been very deleted from the record. We don't know how long he really served in prison. We do know a lot of little bits and pieces. And much like today, when if someone is starting to make a difference, when someone starts cracking the code, if you will, we see co-option. People get co-opted. They send people in to handle them, etc. Nicholas Culpepper died at a very young age. He was 37 when he died. He died of tuberculosis after a wound that he got in the Civil War because he was out there on the battlefield. His wife, there's a little bit of, bet you didn't know this, his wife went on to marry his worst enemy, and then they printed a pile of books under his name, with all kinds of ridiculous quackery, like really, really ridiculous, ridiculous quackery. So therefore, they tried to push him down, they tried to get rid of his name and his and of course they haven't, because that's where it goes. We've managed to keep him alive as well. But you need to go back to the old books. One of the other things I want to talk about today is, and I just put a video about, about this on my YouTube and on our KX TV. Jason's made everyone here aware of the importance of books, of old books, old knowledge. But okay, we know they're changing history. We know they change history all the time. Sometimes we go. But old books is where we dig. That's where we find the good information. Now, that's not to say it's, there's new books coming out with further information. For me, health, that's what I do with herbalism and things like that. We have modern science that helps us to understand certain things better than someone in 1860 would have understood. Because now we have the ability to look at through microscopes and analyze what is actually going on with these various herbal pro products that we're using, etc. But we have a major problem right now. We, unlike any other time in history, have a problem right now that is unbelievably scary. And that's called AI. And I'm not talking Terminator and all that kind of crap, Skynet. I'm talking ChatGPT throughout this video. AI is writing books. And they're flooding. When you go to Amazon, you can pick any topic, especially if you talk about non-fiction topics. You can pick, I did on my video, I talked about foraging. And there is a flood of books that have been published in the last seven months on preppers or foraging or herbal medicine. And I've gone through and read a pile of them. And the information is not just wrong, it's dangerous. Now, if you go get an AI written cookbook about making bread and you screw it up, okay, so it goes with garbage and you what you wasted 35 cents for a flour, whatever. But when you have AI now putting out books, writing about how to identify mushrooms. Yeah, we have a little problem here because we've got like in North America and Europe about 6,000 breeds of mushrooms. And more than half of them will kill you. Like, really kill you. Not a little bit of kill you. And most people don't understand. We don't screw around with mushrooms. I teach foraging classes, and this is my number one rule. You don't screw around with mushrooms. Because there is no antidote. There's nothing they can do for you. You eat a death cap, which looks just like a parasol. Parasols are yummy. Death caps will kill you in 48 hours. And you can't survive. There's nothing they can do. Oh, no, there is. They can transplant your heart, liver, kidneys, and your pancreas. But if they can't do that, 
there's nothing you can do. So when we have AI now writing books on subjects like how to identify mushrooms, how to make herbal remedies, and in my video I'm literally like, I oh my god, they can't be putting this out. I can't believe that someone would put this out. First of all, hello, grammar check. Are we ever? Is anyone going to actually check the grammar? Do they leave this before they put it out? But we have a problem. We have a serious problem. And I go through and I'm talking about the fact that, like, now we've got to a point where you can't just go, I want to get a book on foraging mushrooms, for example. We now have to look at the author, research the author, make sure that this author has been writing for that subject for at least 20 years before you pick a book. If you're picking up any kind of book that's on healing, health, home, I literally, the list is endless. We now actually have to research every single thing about that book, especially if it's been printed in the last 24 months. We have no choice. We're now at a time where AI is writing websites and creating entire websites. I have multiple websites myself, and one of the plug-in software pieces that I use sent me a big announcement six months ago going, would you like to use AI to make your website? Fuck no. <laughs> no. Right? But this is it. Like, we now have a web. It's been bad for a while. If anyone has actually done any, you go do a Google search on what are the health benefits of black seed oil, you will come up with 85 bajillion websites that have no content other than it's obviously copy and pasted from each other. And they will have no references. So when you sit there and go, okay, it says this, black seed oil will cure, is the cure to everything except death. That's Hippocrates, and it's true. Black seed oil, everyone should be taking black seed oil every day, but no one tastes bad, suck it up and take it anyway. Right? Black seed oil, Nigel sativa. Very important to know the actual proper Latin name in this case because there's a lot of other oils and seeds that are called black seed, and it's not. So Nigel sativa, my little recommendation, everyone should be taking it. Well, we have websites now that are being created that are just pushing crap content. They have no references. They tell you it does something, but they don't give you any link as to where is this information coming from? Because you get to the point where it's a copy from a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And now we have AI, which is now doing the same thing. And you have I literally every day get emails. Hi, we're such and such a company. We use AI. We love to write a lovely article. We can guarantee that you'll get 20,000 views in the first 48 hours for the cheap low price of $5.99 deal for you today. Well, a lot of people are gonna take them up on that. Be like, well, hey, I can write articles, I can pump out articles every day, just give it a subject. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening not just in health, that's happening in history, geography, sciences, education is rife right now with AI, shall we say, extremist propaganda? Yeah. And it's being passed on as real. It's being passed on everywhere as real. So, I just want to make it more aware. Hoard your box, number one. Go find the old box. And number two, research, research, research. Don't trust anything that anyone says on the website. I've seen some of the most obnoxiously bad recommendations in the fields of health from you know, certified something or others. I'm not sure whether they're certified in, but it's questionable. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Did anyone have any questions or want to throw anything out? I don't know what my time is. Martin, I've been talking, I have no idea. Have I just used up all my time? Do we have time for questions? I don't know. <laughs> what Jason? Got plenty of time. Okay. Also. So yes my darling. Yes. Excellent. Hold 
Hold on, let me rephrase that. What's the, what she asked? Do you mind know about the new German new medicine? Which is a lot of stuff that's coming out right now. Everything has its place. I am someone who is very much against belief structures. I never, on my shows that I do, I don't speak in absolutes. I don't speak in this is the truth. Because the fact of the matter is, we don't know what the truth is. None of us do. So when I look at things like medical things like that, like the German New Medicine, it is something I keep on the table. When I'm analyzing data, I use some of that data when I'm analyzing it. Is it the be all end all? No. We have to be balanced, right? It's a little bit of everything. So I deal with a little bit of homeopathy. I do herbalism. I have been an aromatherapist for um, 30 odd years. So I take it from everything. I take from, listen, Western medicine, this is one of the things I talk about all the time, is Western medicine serves a purpose, antibiotics. Should we take them when we have a little splinter in our finger? No, we should not. If you have a cold, should you take antibiotics? No, you should not. But there are times when antibiotics will save your life. Times when you need something and you need it right fucking now. We can't wait around for the two days, three days for the herbal tinctures and teas, etc. Some Western medicine serves its purpose. Now, the problem is, of course, is discerning. Right, and that takes your research, and that's what you've got to go through and figure things out for yourself what works for you. We're not cookie cutters. We did not all come out of the same cookie box. Every single person in this room is completely different. We have different needs. We have we need different diets. We have different things that are our weaknesses. We have epigenetic things. People will take that into consideration. They'll say, I've never had a vaccine, but their parents did. That causes a genetic change, those vaccines. When you have someone given certain drugs, or your mother took, can affect your children. So we have different needs. And that's why I never speak in absolutes. When people get up and they talk about diet, which is one of my big ones, when people talk about diet and people are like, Oh, I am a vegan. <laughs> right, if it works for you. I did that for two years. I literally almost died. I literally almost died. And I did it when I was living in Thailand, where they understand vegan diet. Like they, like they, they know how to go. It's not for everyone. The carnivore diet's not one. It's not for everyone. Everyone is different. What works for you is not going to work for you. And when we understand that concept, that we are all individual and we have our own individual needs, then you can start looking at what feels good for you. For me, I work a lot on intuition. And that's one of our weaknesses that we have, is we've been taught since we're a little bad high, don't listen to your body. Don't listen to what the little voice in the back of your head is telling you. And retraining ourselves to actually listen to what our bodies need is huge. We got here in San Diego, we went to the grocery store. You've never seen anything so funny as the entire archaic team walking into a grocery store. <laughs> that shopping cart was interesting. Let me tell you. And I literally went to the orange like oranges. Oranges, 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 and clementines, and we'll have some lemons, because that's what my body was saying to me. I just got off an airplane, and God knows what I've been dosed with. I need citrus, and I need it now. And coffee, but that, that is another part of <laughs> So, listening to our bodies, what our body tells us we need, that is one of the most fundamental, important things that we can do for our overall health. And parents, that means listening, letting your kids tell you what they want. And of course, I'm not talking about Fruit Loops, because they will all play that trick on you. I have five, trust me, I've been down that road. But when you have kids, and I get this all the time, I used to run parenting groups. I was very, very heavily involved in maternal and infant health. Way, way back. And people would say to me, my kids, they won't eat in certain bird of food here. They won't eat eggs, they won't eat cheese, they won't eat milk, they won't eat vegetables, they won't eat whatever. 
I'm like, okay, then they'll give it to them. When they want it, they'll eat it. Now, of course, that's what you've got to talk about rationalities, right? Like, I mean, if your kid's like, I want fruit loops with Kool Aid on it for breakfast. Okay, that would be done if I want something. I'd say, no, no, that's not going to happen. But when kids, especially young kids, they will eat what they need. They're in tune. They're very in tune with their bodies. And if they decide that they're going to eat scrambled eggs every fucking meal for the next three weeks, okay. That's what their body wants. That's what they need. Same with older people. I have a friend of mine whose grandmother is in care. And she's got dementia. She's 24. And she went on a thing where she was like, I, she, all she wanted to eat was oranges. And the, 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 the nurse who was coming to care for her got really upset. Like, she will only eat oranges. Only, what are we going to do? We have to force, and they were talking about putting her on IVs and all this kind of thing, and force feeding. And her daughter, who's a good friend of mine, was like, I don't fucking think so. If she wants oranges, give her oranges. A week later, massive colds went through, and everyone in that nursing home got sick as a dog. Guess who didn't get sick? Not even a In that dementia state, she had reverted into that place of, I can tell you what I want. I know I don't have all these preconceived notions around me saying, oh, I gotta eat three vegetables and this and that and the other. No, she, all she learned was fucking oranges, and that's what they gave her. Healthy as a horse. Learning that internal to listen to our internal voices, those cravings that we have. Sometimes you can have the same craving, and sometimes the same craving can be for chocolate. Chocolate is a perfectly legitimate craving. Okay? I stand here tell you all, see your chocolate, you're allowed to crave chocolate. Our chocolate's better, but I won't, I won't argue with that. If you're craving chocolate, guess what? It's probably because you need the serotonin, so have at her. Well, dark chocolate at 12 o'clock at night is never a good idea unless you want to stay up and watch, I don't know, YouTube for six hours. Not that I speak from experience. <laughs> Listen to our bodies. Listen to your intuition. It also comes in this venue. It's not just about our bodies. It's the information you're presented. The food of information that you're presented. Listen to what the little boy says. Does it resonate? Can you feel it? I've been doing this journey for a long time. And I've met quite a few interesting people along the way. And there's times when you meet someone, you go, oh, you're just not right, are you? You're just not right. And then you just go, okay, well, that's, that's, that's nice information. I'll just put that over here. Maybe I'll look at it, etc. Listen to the intuition. Because the old media is just as corrupt as the mainstream media. It is very corrupt. And they are selling all kinds of fear porn, and they are selling all kinds of shit. Listen to your little voice inside that says, you know, I'm not so sure this is legitimate. Maybe we should question this. And the problem is, when we get into the airport's truth or community, it becomes an echo chamber. And it's planted that way on purpose. So you will get things, shall we go, digress to 2020. And they say, there's graphene oxide in those vaccines, don't get them because the 5G is going to turn it on and then you're going to turn into a zombie. No, there's not. There never was. The 5G might break your brain in other ways, but it's not going to turn you into a zombie because of graphene. But that was repeated so often in social media. It was repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. The people believed it because it goes from being repeated so many times, it's now in your head. But this is fact. And we lose sight of the fact that, well, did anyone actually show us a study? Show us, like, I don't know, a chemical analysis, probably these. No. 
And unfortunately, in the truth of community, that is one of the worst problems we deal with. Stuff has been deliberately put out there to skew the story, whitewash this over here. You know, Trump is going to rescue us all. Just trust the plan. Trust the plan. So that's when that inner voice is the most important. When we hear stuff, and sometimes it's just stuff that you don't know. And you gotta go down the rabbit hole and you gotta go search for it and you gotta go figure out what's going on. But listen to that little inner voice that goes, yeah, something's not right here. This just doesn't really connect. It's our job. It's our responsibility. This is the one thing on this journey is learning self-responsibility because we've been had that programmed out of us for now generations, especially this last generation, but especially generation, right? No self as well. It's, it's, you upset me, I need a safe corner. <laughs> but we have to be self-responsible. And that comes down to literally now every fact of our life, whether we're researching history, whether we're researching health, education, no matter what it is you're looking at, we have to be responsible for the choices we make. And it's a tough place. It's a tough place. And sometimes it means kind of going back to school in the way of educating yourself how to do the research. But in the end run, you stand on your own two feet. And you will know what you know without it being you know, like the whisper, the Chinese whispers of the like, she said and she said and she said and she said and somehow that message was so diluted at the end. Self-responsibility. Listen to the, that's my number one message. It's like, listen to the little voice in your head. Sometimes we have mm, the filters of belief structures that fall over top and you kind of have to learn to discern through those as well. But you need that little voice to give a little bit of balance to you and listen to it. Because right now, I think a lot of people, and I hear this from a lot of people right now, especially in the last six months, is those little voices are fucking screaming, going, this is not right. Why are we here? I don't like this anymore. Can I find a cave to go sit in the cave? But listen to your little voices. I think that's all I have to say for today. Uh, my main website that all my shows are on is rts.earth. Um, my membership site is unfuckersunite.com. And my skincare and my herbalism site is guysgarden.com. I will, I will write it. I'm really, really, I was not prepared for this. I didn't have thumb drives ready to be able to, to have so people could buy thumb drives. Uh, I have a massive collection of history books, and my history collection library is 264 gig thumb drives, and it's packed out. A good portion of it is. Most of it is pre 1800s. Yes, sir. Are you seeing the last one? There was like a lot of stuff going on in social media we're like oh you need this health bundle and it's all these things if you're going to do a course i always say to people like really look into it because there's a lot of courses and you're spending three four five thousand dollars and what are they actually teaching you right so look into like there's a lot of courses out there that are called health bundles that you think they teach you 
a little bit of homeopathy, a little bit of herbalism, a little bit of diet stuff, etc. And really, you can learn all of that from about two books that would cost you less than half of what you pay for the course. Be aware that there is a very large push to sell a lot of courses, to sell these bundled things. Oh, you have these books. And I've bought some of them. And literally got them. Really? Really? It's, it's not, I wouldn't even call it misinformation and disinformation. I call it fluff information. Yes. Right? Like it's like, oh, we're going to tell you all about the benefits of dandelions. Okay, dandelions are great for you. They have lots of iron, they have vitamin K. If you get them in the spring, really good in salad. Every part of the dandelion is edible. The roots make actually decent coffee, believe it or not, actually has caffeine. But you know what, like, you can, I just told you everything you need to know about daily lines. Did you really need to read a book? You don't. You really don't. So, like, this is, I call it fluff information. There's a lot of fluff being put out there. It's real, but it's not intensive. It's, they don't really go in depth and tell you about important plants like Herb Robert. And that's anyone who's seen, I don't know, because I've had three people come up to me and ask me about this. I did a video talking about Herb Robert and how important it is everyone should be growing it. A lot of people have ordered seeds in America here from, I don't know, God knows where, and they are not germinating. You got another piece for me? Oh, I'll give you that. I'll give you that right there. Oh, there we go. So this lovely lady who obviously is Herb Robert, I did not bring anything with me from England because I just figured green dry stuff is probably not a good thing on the air. Um, this is her broader. It is an, it can be classified as an invasive wheat. And it is one of the most brilliant health things you will ever eat. I recommend everyone grow it. It grows like a weed. Um, it's really easy to grow. It's really easy to manage. And it is so good for you. Go to our cat's TV, become a member, and watch my video all about it. Um, I have the seeds, I save all the seeds. Everyone I know who's bought seeds in the States, they could not germinate them. I will send you seeds, I guarantee they'll germinate. So just send me an email and I will put some seeds in a packet for you and send them up to you. Just let me know. Thank you. So there you go. And eat your little Robert's delicious. <laughs> information on the Herb Robert. Okay. They right. said audio's good, yeah. The audio's good. Video. Not perfect, but a lot better than it was. Many of the books I read in prison concern how the mind actually interfaces and manipulates your audio. I was really impressed by publisher back here. I don't know what books he was going to bring. He's got too many across the street. But I noticed on the table where the end of our relations. Ah. Also, the door lectures are on the table right now. I was like, wow, it just took me back. I've been back in the front of the door right now. It's been 15, 20 years since I read those books. But the data that's in those books that were recorded in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, when those books were published, is still relevant today. There hasn't been any fundamental changes in reality that would alter the fact that the human mind does interface with the law working around. Those books and uh, the Thomas Crowley books, which are across the street on the shelves, these are the books that really opened my, my eyes. It wasn't Rhonda Byrne and the Secret. It wasn't. <laughs> uh, 
As a matter of fact, the material in the secret offended me because I had already read Thomas Crowley from 1902. I had already read Wallace Waters. I had already read the Dorn lectures and the Edward lectures. And I know where she got the information and she didn't cite those sources, and that's me as offensive. The, uh, the secret is full of good information, but it's full of information that was already presented by many people in many conventions, people who were giving lectures, circuits, tours, and they're unmentioned by Ron DeMarco. Ron but they're back there on the table. They're across the street in the book tree. If you're interested, they're real cheap books, but they're called the Edinburgh Lectures and the Door Lectures. Wallace J. Waddles, Thomas Trower, these are fantastic books. The things that I have presented on YouTube, all I did was take older concepts and get wrap them in a more technologically sophisticated form. So people can understand it today. Our frames of reference are very different. So I present material according to the frames of reference that would be received by you, as opposed to how they were, they were written in 1903, in 1910, in 1970. Those books are fantastic. But that's where I got a lot of the information. And in my own books, I cite that. We're going to take another break before we bring Joel of the Perceiver. You guys know him as Toltec Shannon. He'll be next.
Chiba, what sounded better? The lapel mic or the big mic? assassination. This lady brought out a life life magazine from way back in the day where the Mandela has even gone into the text and showed six people in the car. And the first song, there's only four. <laughs> An extra, it's like a limousine type thing. They added two seats. They added two seats. And that bar was in there. They added two seats. That is six people in their car. We know damn well there was only four. Sheba, there's your Mandela. Four people in the car. Here's pictures from the old, what's the date? 1964, October 2nd, 25 cents. The Mandela, Mandela, even the Berenstain Bears, the older books, they've changed, changed to the new Berenstain. This, this happened in my life, one moment, yeah. two or three later. It, to show as soon as the construct knows there's a discrepancy, it tries to correct it. But it noticed that I noticed. It's amazing. It's amazing. You've seen it with your own eyes. Six, six in the car. And that's not how it really went down.
When's Max coming on? Uh, after lunch. One o'clock. We're gonna break for lunch and then sometime oh, after lunch and it's gonna lunch.
Um, so they found these very strange movements similar to like how people discovered yoga. They discovered what they call magical passes. And they do them in, in small groups or large groups, and it has this effect on a wave of energy goes across everybody. And so you, you get this benefit of being doing the same thing together in a very powerful way. Um, and so it, it leads to a lot of lucid dreaming experiences the more you do these movements. Um, and so along with that, reading the Castaneda books, it's like a manual. He channeled that information. And he, he was guided to write the books in the way that he did. For those that would be interested to come along in the future, they could use this book, this system as a way of learning how to cross into other worlds through dreaming. That may sound uh, not realistic, but when you spend time with really powerful shamans, you realize that these people do walk into other layers of the onion and learn how to stay there and heal themselves. They do very strange things in order to uh, create a really pristine awareness, such as sun gazing, cloud gazing. Uh, anytime you're able to reach silence and stay very focused, on what you're observing without talking to yourself, profound shifts of perception occur. Um, but my training was very intense in the very early years. I was training with exorcists, medicine men, people that were doing very deep ritual in order to achieve what they call dream power. The benefit of exploring this side of things is that you learn how to hang out in silence. You learn how to feel more, and it opens up like your memory banks, which leads to the recapitulation. Um, when you recapitulate your memories and you breathe in the energy that you left behind in your past, and you breathe out the energy that you took on from others, it's the most powerful form of purification that I've discovered. But if you mix that up with fasting, if you mix that up with sun gazing, learning to drink the sunlight, instead of just learning to, to become lucid with it, you can actually draw it into your body. So the sun is a consciousness. It's a very, in my, from the Toltec system, they say it's a masculine consciousness. And you can have a relationship with the sun. You can, you can receive guidance and communicate directly with the earth mother, with the sun, with trees. That's the benefit of getting your perception to a place where you're no longer under the same type of hypnosis. Now, a lot of us in this room are coming out of hypnosis. We're learning how to feel and use our intuition to know whether we're being lied to or, or whether you know it resonates truth. And that's a very powerful thing to, to be connecting to all of you in this way. It creates a really unique fusion of intent. And that's what shamans focus on is developing something called unbethy intent. And we're all capable of it. Everyone has the ability to get clear on their priorities in their life and come out of the distraction of the theater of this world. Information can help you unlearn, but eventually even information becomes too heavy. So you gotta let it all go and just experience joy and sadness and embrace the intensity of being alive. If we get caught up trying to be something for others or try to maintain a certain body of knowledge, and for me, that's letting go of the Castaneda material. It's been a tool, but eventually that tool becomes a crutch. Uh, so we all go through these stages in our life where 
things are shifting. And so we have to learn to adapt and seek change because change is coming. It's always that's something we can count on. And so the Toltecs refer to that as being a fluid warrior, always ready, not attached to outcome, not caught up in story or drama. Our family members often want to keep us in drama. Our social circles are often based on, you know, uh, comparisons and jealousies and, and power dynamics that are no longer serving us. And so we're having to get really strong with our boundaries. We're starting to have to get clear about who we talk to, where our attention goes, what is it that we're really doing here. Um, dreaming is a very powerful way of getting into your body and feeling anything that is dealt with. A lot of us have some wounds from our childhood around attachments. Like I was given everything I wanted, but not what I needed. Right, so that creates this whole dynamic for my shadow work to play out. So for me to take really good care of myself and, and provide those needs and parent myself, you know, is a very evolutionary step. For others, it might be the opposite. They never got what they wanted, they only got what they needed. And then there's a loom associated with these different uh, ways in which to work blueprinted. Right, so your blueprint is super powerful. The first thing that happened to you, the first girlfriend, the first experience with freedom, the first uh, any anything that it creates like a blueprint that will play out throughout your life, and that can be positive and negative. Um, when you recapitulate your memories, and you can do this in a lot of ways. We do it like theater where you play out an experience, like an argument you had with your dad, and you play it out with your friends, and then you play it out the way it happened, and then the next time you play it the way you want it, wish you would you do the things you say the things you wish you would have said. And then you have them play you and you play your dad. And then you it gets emotional. You start working all this stuff out and you feel all these feelings that you hadn't felt, that you've been trying to keep, you know, kind of stored and undealt with. Um, so it takes courage to do this work, to do the shadow work. But it's so liberating when you do because your relationship with your friends and family and your lover will evolve profoundly. And there's nothing more magical than finding somebody in your life that can be a mirror, that can challenge you, that can match your power, that is willing to say how they feel. And, and you can get to a real honest place with yourself. You can get to a really honest place with all of your relationships, even the ones that may seem that, 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 that it's too difficult. There's usually a way to heal it. And, and you, honestly, we're going to wish that we had on our deathbeds. We're going we're gonna to feel undealt with stuff at the end of our day. But if you don't have anything undealt with because you went and, and faced it, then you can have a really powerful rite of passage with your second birth. Death is a really powerful thing for Toltecs. They make friends with their death. They ask their death for advice. They call it using death as an advisor. They say death is the only one that would be honest with you. Because we're all under hypnosis to various degrees. And we're all out for ourselves. We may think that we are being selfless by doing certain things, but usually it's to make ourselves feel a certain way. So it's okay to admit that we're, we're like that, that that's our dynamic. So I like to think of this as we're an entry. And this dream is like our base dream, and it's a really amazing place. 
but you can save your sexual energy, which is also dreaming energy, and learn how to start to trim, start to tap into what it would be like to go to the other side, to explore other dimensions and other realities. And the more of us that get into this, the easier it will be. The few that are doing this have a harder time because the collect, there's not enough people doing it. Meditation is amazing, yoga, these things are really popular. I believe in the future, lucid dreaming, shamanic passes, sorcery, movements, these things will become very desired because we're going to want access to resources that shamans have known about for a long time, but it's been kept private. And for good reason. There was, these are not easy things to learn. And we don't want people to end up diagnosed with schizophrenia because they started having experiences that are unexplainable. But I'm here to tell you those experiences, there is no such thing as a hallucination. You're just seeing energy. It doesn't matter what drug, it's just that there is energy all around us. We want to learn how to see that energy without having to take a drug in order to see it. And we don't want to end up in a situation where we cannot determine how we want to experience this world. So some people open these doors aggressively, recklessly, and in a, in a way that doesn't isn't sustainable for long term. So, so I appreciate what Castaneda books offer as a way to do this that is truly effective, it's magical. We are magical beings in a magical world. There may be, a, there is a construct and there is interference being run and we are being controlled by forces that feed off of human awareness. But just like we seek food, like we're all going to go have lunch. It's the same thing for these forces. They're attracted to our energy because it's bright, it's beautiful, and it gives them nourishment. So we are not at the top of the food chain. But that doesn't mean that, 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 that this is a negative situation. It just gives us all the opportunity in the world to remember how powerful we are. So that's what shamans do is they stop feeding this force. They discipline themselves so completely that they're able to build their chi. We're born with a certain amount of chi, but we can build a lot of chi once we learn how to take care of ourselves in these unique ways. And so I was fortunate to be around people that had, uh, became masters of that. And it affected me. And it, 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 they lent me their energy at times in order to have a glimpse of the things that they were seeing and doing. Um, and then the Castaneda book started to mean more and more. I, I've read these things over and over and over and over. And every time I read them, it's like I've never read them before because they now mean something so much more than they could have prior. My wife does a lot of really powerful work with women in the Tantra world, and um, what her and I are doing together is really strong. We have community meetings, and people come, you know, it's not recorded, and so people come, and they get vulnerable, and they share, and it moves the crowd, it moves the people about meeting, they're, they're very effective, and it gives them you know, a type of support that, that's hard to find in this world. Um, so I highly recommend that you all consider attending these on, online. It's all free. And um, I, I'm just super, super thankful to be holding space in this way. Um, my wife and I are, have had the same kind of history where we practice the same teachers. And so as a, as a woman, she has a totally different feeling and experience from what we went through. And um, so we we are holding sort of two different sides of the storyline and it makes for a, a really powerful place.
platform. And we're, we're not the only ones doing this. There are other people doing incredible things. What Jason has done for the world, the community here that is formed around our kids, it's so empowering and, and so much freedom. You know, and that's what Toltec's focus on is freedom of perception. Freedom to remember how powerful you are. For me, that power will be discovered in the dream side of things. And when I say dreams, I don't just mean at night. There's a very specific, there's a very uh, particular way of interacting with this dream that's called dreaming awake, where you put your, you're basically in a trance and you're, you're interacting in this world in a very, as if you were on mushrooms all the time. That's, that's why the movements are so powerful. They will alter your perception. Um, you know, you could, I, I think the sleep deprivation too. People think they can't go without sleep and they, and they will, it's too, too dangerous. And it, I used to feel the same. But if you build, if you switch your mindset on that, or switch your mindset on how being sick is a negative thing, you know, fever dreams are the most powerful experiences of my life. It's when I'm in deep fever, I can do lucid dreaming on a level that I just couldn't possibly without that experience. Um, so when we embrace the challenges in our life and see them as that, that everything's happening for a reason, uh, that, that brings matter, that shifts your perspective on everything. And you start changing the story, you become the writer of your own story instead of what people have told you about not getting enough sleep or being sick. Uh, but yeah, for four days and four nights without food and water is what people do for a vision quest, and they do that for a reason. Something happens to you, you know, you're being supported by the group, and so you feel that you can tell that they're holding space for you, they're eating on your behalf, they're drinking water on your behalf, there's a fire being burned in your behalf, and you feel this energetic support, so it doesn't, it's not like you're out there on your own, you're being ushered into a magical layer of reality. Um, and so these things, whether it's a, a disciplined martial art practice where you become powerful in that way, or you go and work with a powerful teacher who's lucid and to help you unlock your dream power, uh, there's so many ways to go inward and get to know what you're capable of. Um, and you just have fun with it, you know, what shamans call it, if, if you're not on a path of heart, then really consider how can I get back on a path of heart? Because your child, your innocence, your desire, your longing to be free from this construct represents that you're, you're, you're activated, you're, you, you're alive, you're not being manipulated like the majority. And that, that calling is going to get more intense, and some of you are going to be called to go in, into um, a depth of being that most people don't even know is possible because of how things are happening. The veil is really lifting, and it will be easier and easier for us to experience the magical side of this realm. Um, so. If anyone has any questions, I think I'll uh, drop it at that for now and uh, go from there. No reason not. You want to go ahead? Just wondering if, perhaps from your experience with your life, if you could um, share, like, just the awesomeness, the, the inspiring um, nature of being a parent and the attachment that nurtures that, but also being unattached to the role. Wow, thank you. Really good question. Yeah, yeah it's been an honor to raise two little medicine children. 
<laughs> really, really powerful to that I was given the opportunity to put myself to be a father to and I raised them inside of all of the training I was doing. I was just dragging them all over the world, learning from teachers and putting them in unique situations. Um, really powerful people have to learn how to control their attention. So if you're constantly worried and projecting worry and fear into someone's life, whether it's your child or your parent or a friend, it just makes it that much more difficult for them to discover their power. So finding, finding that balance of letting them have experiences and trusting that their heart and mind and soul is in a good place. Um, you know, and you know, there are times in which prayer can be really powerful, uh, where you set intent or you, you use objects and protect your children in their home. This is one of the ways parents are really powerful. They can develop unbending intent because they become selfless and they can do whatever it takes for their child. But if you don't strike a balance with that, then you won't take care of yourself. And then you'll leave that work to your child because everything gets passed on from parent to child. All of our dealt with stuff, unfortunately, they have to pick up. But if we dwell on the past and beat ourselves up for the things that we weren't aware of, then we create a reality tunnel based on that shame and guilt. So we, we get to be really creative here. Uh, old school shaman females, they would say when they were with their, their child, it was their total focus, but as soon as they had time away, it, it was, they didn't focus on their child at all as a means to balance that attention. Because we, we want to live a life that's really full so that they will be called to the same. Um, but I will add that the love you have for your children they will feel it the rest of their days. And even if, this is why the recapitulation is so powerful, is that we can make peace with our parents and we can go back into the past with our kids and go into the memory. And like I said, with the theater dynamic or just by voicing it into the field, you can make amends, you can release and free uh, trauma in, in a variety of ways. Two questions. Um, two questions. Um, I think you just answered it, but what role does creating physical piece of art have to do with this ritual? Like how uh, integral is that? And then the second question is how do we get involved with what you do? Yeah, I mean, most people, when you become conscious in your dreaming, you'll be called to whether it's poetry or singing or uh, actual physical art. Um, there's a desire to get to reclaim your creativity on a deep level because your imagination is your magic. Um, so for some people, you know, um, they beat their they, they beat themselves up all their lives because they can't do art, and it's like a real there's like all this energy around that because they can't produce the art that they wish they could or that they see in their mind. And so there comes a point where we can just kind of let that go and trust that as we build lucidity, if we may be trying to manifest art in a way that isn't natural for us, and so for me, like I. I have found it in martial arts. I don't need it to be put down on paper. Uh, it doesn't have to be that seen, or I don't need anyone to see it. As long as I know it's within me, I just use my imagination in the most creative way that I can. 
uh, and it's incredible. Um, I, I'm forgetting your second question. Oh, yeah, please. Um, my email is just the best way to reach out if you're interested in connecting. So it's it's for direction seven seven at gmail.com, which is uh, sorry, F O U R D I R E C T I O N N S seven seven at gmail.com. And you can find me on YouTube at Receiver and you'll find my email there. And I appreciate it, everyone. Thank you for your time and it's really an honor. Up and down this entire strip, on a lot of nice little coffee shops, little snack shops, restaurants. Uh, I just ate at a Vietnamese restaurant across the street. You got an hour, hour and 20 minutes to break. We have extra time today. We're, not, we're going to go a little bit longer than we anticipated. Uh, I'll be presenting. I'll be presenting our. I will be presenting autodidactic, Logan of Decoach Reality, and the grand finale is Maxi. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
similar to yeah, you've got you get a safe room submission. And it's too, I'm not vegan, I'm not even vegetarian, but I do like vegan restaurants because there's a lot I there's a lot of food, so like all the meat I say. Well, I eat fish. I don't eat meat. I would eat meat, but I'm not eating any meat that's coming close to my house. None of it's good. It's oh. all. It's all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. And yeah, that's a nonprofit. I do some work for me in my house. You live in California? No, I live in Oklahoma. Oh, okay. I'll go off the Yeah, I
And, you know, a lot of people used to get into the pyramids and, you know, the old megaliths and all this stuff, but it would have been, I don't know, about eight, nine years ago, I came across a channel in the earth and um, she educated me on the mud flood and our star forts and Tartaria, and I've pretty much sort of been following that path ever since. So I'm from Australia, obviously, and our history is um, just over 200 years old. Uh, 17, what was it, 1788, they turned up to a barren country, we're told, and within, you know, 30, 40 years, we had fully built out cities, megalithic buildings, you know, the whole thing. Um, trams everywhere, trains, and you've got to wonder, you know, how does this all happen when they turn up to a country and they're not even supposed to know where the clay pits are, where the, the iron ore is, and once they find that, if they can get to it, then they've got to go to all the manufacturing or the transport. And so we're just, what, what I found out is history is just not a story, right? It's his story. It's a story we've been told. And so that's the sort of journey I've been on for the last, um, yeah, sort of eight years. I think my channel's coming up to four years. Of course, I used to follow Martin. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so you know, we, we talk about lots of things. Obviously, I've interviewed many you know, amazing people, and um, it's really been, you know, for everyone, right? the last four years has been pretty life changing. You know, we've all gone through a lot. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm for one, I'm pretty glad I've been through some trials myself for sure. But I mean, look what I've been 2019, right? I, I don't think anyone would really want to go back. And we hear a lot of talk that it's bad. But I think this this whole this whole scenario of the last four years, it's just to wake us up. It's the only way, thing, right? We're being shown what the world really is and who these people telling us what to do really are. You know, and, it, and it's interesting because a lot of people are trying to wake us people up. But I often wonder if, you know, if, if this waking up is us seeing it as it is. And the other people that you can't talk to, that they're still seeing it as we, you know, saw it five years ago. Like we didn't believe it. You know. We didn't see them going so crazy anyway. So we're in a very interesting time. And, um, you know, I, I got here to America. You know, I'm not really sure, you know, I've been talking, you know, people talk about manifesting and creating destiny and reality and all this stuff. So that's what I've been doing, really, tr trying to put all this stuff into practice for the last, um, well, at least a year. I moved across the country. I live in a, in a dome off-grid um, in a country of 150 acres. So that's all, all nice and fun. Um, and I want to travel and now I'm, I'm you know, through the grace of other people, it's why I'm here. Um, and everyone says I love this story, so I'll tell them again. Um, basically, I got here on the 5th, and at, at the end of the month before, I didn't even have a plane ticket. Um, and I was sort of like, oh, I'm going to America, you know. It never happened, and I was getting pretty close. I was like, well, you know, something happened, you hurry up. Um, <laughs> Um, and so I thought, well, what can I do? You know, I've sort of done everything I thought I could. So I thought, well, I have to pack my bag. So I packed my bag. And I, seriously, the next day, because all this stuff started happening, and two days later I had a ticket, and then three days later I was on a plane, and here I am, and everything's just falling into place. <laughs> see what's going on and, and that gives us a choice, right? 
to change it. A lot of people out there don't think that they've got choice anymore. <laughs> with that show so uh, you know you know be way right. And so I, I think the choice is that you know we can go forward and create whatever we want. And that's really I think where the focus should be. A lot of people think they want to save everyone else and save the world, but the truth that I can see is everyone's on their own journey. Right? So sometimes by you know yelling at people and trying to make them wake up, maybe we should let them start on their journey just be the change that, that we want to say, and then if people you know, want to change our status and not come and ask questions, right? And we can pull the world forward rather than trying to push people around, you know? So, um, yeah, that's really my big message is, you know, I mean, look, what, look what's happened here, you know? Look what Jason's pulled together and Dawn and the whole crew. You know, who's having a good day today? Clipboard back here, so you can put your names. There's a clipboard right there. 
If you're in the San Diego, Los Angeles area, you want to do regular meals with a bunch of Arabs, a bunch of people who want to do some regular talk. Or My very first meetup was because somebody in the community just decided to do a new one and put a bunch of people together and they didn't invite me. So, <laughs> so, so I'll never do that again. I, I, I'm not opposed to that. You just have to ask the boss. She's back there somewhere. Where she's taking stuff. But Kevin, Martin, these guys are dynamic personalities. We're friends for life. Um, I don't like to not make friends easily, never have. I'm very guarded with my relationships. And uh, I'm just very impressed by these two. And I'm equally impressed. My very first podcast that actually got me a lot of attention was with Santos Bonacci. But Santos didn't really talk, he just listened to me. The one who, the one who kept the conversation going, the one who kept he, he knew what questions to ask to trigger me because I was in my infancy as, as someone in the public. So it required somebody to ask those questions to get me to talk. And it's Logan Jason of Decode Your Reality. <laughs> Made some of these serious inquiries asking me, hey, why do you why do you discourse with people like like Logan when his his expertise is in seeing mathematical patterns in Gematria and this isn't something that you promote on your channel? And while I don't focus on Gematria per se, I'm a simulationist and I don't even believe in the mathematical construct. And because of that, people like this can see. The particulars. They can see far beyond what I can see. I take generalities and I make them I appreciate it down to concepts that people can understand. But it's men like this that can look at the numbers and see how they relate to everything across the board. So this is the value he brings to the table. I'm going to show him let him talk. So this code that is operating in this software 
is the same way our reality is being operated. Our, our, our reality operates through letters, numbers, and symbols. You just don't see them. This, and what you hear, is the final product of the letters, numbers, and symbols. Does that make sense? Okay. You, just don't, you just don't see them. But you can say, we can use the word God because most everybody knows that word, right? That, whatever runs this reality, creates it through letters, numbers, and symbols. Because we can take any word, numerology, the science of numbers, and we can break it down into numbers. We can take any uh, form of a symbol and break it down into numbers. We can do mathematical equations and utilize numbers and formulas, etc., etc. But all this stuff that we're talking about, the letters, numbers, and symbols, they make up a movie. You're inside of a movie. This is a movie, folks. This is a real, your life is being observed. And my truth is, from my research, I've been doing this a long time, over 10 years, that your life's not your own. I know that a lot of you are going to fight against that. You're not going to want to accept that because you're like, well, I, choose, I chose to come here. Well, how do you prove that? Because you made the decision, right? That's, a, that's your proof. But I can take anybody in this audience and I can break you down and I can show you that your life has a predestination to it. Anybody here, I can break down. That's how confident I am because I have over 500 videos on my channel breaking down people, places, and things, showing that these people, places, and things have no choice. I broke it down Pink Floyd, the band. Every band member I showed, they didn't have a choice but to come and form the band called Pink Floyd. Metallica, Michael Jackson, Prince, Twisted Sister, <laughs> Devil Leopard, Led Zeppelin, Led, Led Zeppelin, Beatles. All of these band members have one thing in common, and the same thing that you have in common, is that your destiny is free written. I can, I can support it. I'll never use the word proof because I don't like to say that. I can support it. I can support that everybody has a predestination to it. So the, 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 the base fundamental of your reality is that it's your truth. Everybody has an individual code here. I'm not you and you're not me. I don't pay your bills, you don't pay mine. But yet here we are. Right? And we all have individualistic expressions. Jason was mentioning how he's, I forget exactly how he said it, but he says, I'm this way and I'm that way. Talking about his program. You're all programmed a certain way, and you're being watched. This entire reality is, is, a, is entertainment. Now, there have been many different cultures that have talked about mankind being watched, being observed. And the Greeks talked about mankind being used and being used for food, which was called ambrosia, the nectar of the gods. Okay? So we basically are little batteries inside this construct. And you give off energy through your emotional reactions. When you get angry, you give off an emotional reaction. When you feel love, you give off an emotional reaction. Now you can definitely break it down to the constructs of angels and demons. Big topic, right? 72 angels and demons. 72 plus 72 is 144. Now you can branch off into the 144,000 in theology and the chosen ones. Are you a chosen one? If you're a fan of theology. Are you going to be the chosen one? Well, here's the clue, ladies and gentlemen. Every single one of you are the chosen ones. Everybody here is. If I correlate the 144 to alchemy, the periodic table, which I love to do, and those of you, how many of you know my channel? Raise your hands. Wow. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your support. Really, really good. Big shout out to Jason for Shears. Good to see you. So anyway, so you ladies and gentlemen, you know that are here that know my channel, I like to take numbers and correlate them to the periodic table. Why the periodic table? Well, because our bodies, for the, a lot of these elements of the periodic table, we require them. Our body requires 60 minerals every day. 60 minerals, 60 vitamins, omega threes, the amino acids. This is the construct to keep this thing moving. Right? So the periodic table has a lot to do with our reality numbers. And if you take the number 144, and you correlate that to the periodic table, the element that it links to is an element called neodymium. 
And what was the character who saved the world in the world of Matrix? Neo. 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 144. Neo. 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 And that element will lead into another element called Neon. Neon is the 10th element. And what is the number 10? The binary system. It's the computer code. So the Matrix was onto something. And the writers of the Matrix, whoever that was, because it's very, there was the Sophia League and the Tom Isle House. I've seen a lot of the videos, they brought me from this. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. The Wachowski's ended up putting it out. And they released the Matrix on March 24th, 1999. 1999 in mathematics is the 3003rd prime number. So there's the 33 tied to, let's party that it's going to be 1999. Okay. 1999, March 24th. Why 24? Why did they choose the, the release date for the Matrix on the 24th? Well, first and foremost, in theology, the word Jesus in Greek, where it originally came from, equals the number 24. Jesus had a twin brother. Anybody know his twin brother's name? Thomas. Thomas. And they have, it just so happens that Netflix come out with a show called Lucifer. Anybody seen it? Who was the actor that cast the play Lucifer? What was his birth certificate name? Thomas. That's right, Thomas. I was just watching a, um, I was just watching a show, a repeat of it for me. Everybody ever see The Good Place? Amazing show. The ending show, season four, episode 13. There's 13 is death. The terror is the death card. So they go to visit the architect who actually incarnated into a man who was the casted to play Michael, the architect Michael. And they show up at his door, and his door number is, is whatever, apartment number is 322. Does anybody know the 322 stuff? So you're instantly going to think, Scott Loans! Well, it is. But as I showed Jason, if you take a 360 degree circle, and you locate the number 322 and you go 90 degrees opposite. Anyone want to take a walk? Guess what's across from 322? 138! <laughs> what? <laughs> so the skull and bones have everything to do with the Phoenix of that, everybody. <laughs> no, I decoded the skull and bones, the whole organization. And when I decoded that, I was blown away because I, 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 you know, I, I get to the point of where I'm at a final answer of there's no way mankind could ever cope this reality. People can become consciously aware of their own, yes. But to get it exactly the way it comes out, there's just no way. For instance, in the Matrix, I was breaking it down again, and Morpheus, the scene where Morpheus is sitting down with Neo, and he's about ready to hand over the red and the blue pill. Everybody know that scene? Yeah? Right, make a choice. Well, Neo, Morpheus says to Neo, you're in a prison. And at that exact moment, and you can fact check this, and I would encourage all of you to do it, press pause when Morpheus says prison, and you're going to get a timestamp. And the timestamp that it comes out to, I think it was 58. And the word 58 is tied to my birth card. I don't you know that I use the playing cards. They're all tied to your birthdays. Not all of them, but. And that's the prison playing card. Now, I know that some of you are like, oh, okay, we're just trying to make up with no. I'm, I'm telling you, this is these are facts. I'm not, I'm not trying to blow smoke. I'm telling you what my observations are. My job as an avatar, whatever's using me, is using me to be a messenger. Yeah. Now, I'm not for everyone. I'm not. I don't want to be for everyone. But at least I'm doing my job. I feel like I'm doing my job. So when I wake up every day, I live in Mexico. Been there almost three, over three years, just south of Cancun. I'm originally from Connecticut. Um, but when I wake up every day and my feet hit the floor, I'm in a state of gratitude. And I really look at myself and I'm like, I can't wait to start my day today. Does anybody feel like that? So you guys are, I hope you guys are all like that. I can't wait to start my day today. Right? That's what life's about. So even though my final answer, my final answer, ladies and gentlemen, is that your life's being used. Your life is being used. It's you being used by the I am. I am this. I don't like this. I want to do this. I want to go here. It's not like you doing it. It's whatever your voice in your head, it owns you. So you're here because the voice in your head told you to come here. 
And you'll justify it so many other different ways of why you got here, right? Because oh, I know some of you will refute that you're being used. You, you, you won't tolerate that. I get it. Because no one, feel, no one wants to feel like they're a slave. But my final answer, ladies and gentlemen, is that you are. You are a prisoner here. And the prison is your body. And even though I have a, I have a prison planet series, I have a prison planet one, two, three, and four. And in those videos, I showed with a lot of clarification that mankind's being used. And that's it. What are you going to do with that? You're going to get angry at it? Well, what I found through these prison planet series and everything that I found with all the other videos is that if you're living out your purpose, then you're finding your bliss. How many of you here are living out your purpose? You know you're living out your purpose. You just know it. Pretty awesome. Those of you that don't know your purpose, the beautiful part is you don't know it. <laughs> right? You don't know it. So now you consciously are aware of that. Now it's time to go find it. And maybe my voice right now speaking to you, you're like, yeah, I really want to find out my purpose. How do you find out your purpose? You do the decoding. And how do you decode? Astrology, numerology, mathematics, anything in your life has to go to it. Your high school mascot. Does anybody know the high school mascot? I'm sure everybody knows. There's a code to that. The latitude, longitude of where you live right now. There's a message for you there. Right now, where you're living, where you were born. You can take the numerology of your hospital you were born in, and you can break that down, and there'll be a code there. I went back and I looked at my whole entire life, and I realized my whole life was being coded. And it was coded. You know, on my arm right here, on my right arm, and this is before I even met Jason. All these tattoos, they're all phoenixes. I got these tattoos probably when I was asleep. Didn't even know it. And then when I started to go back and look at the code, my parents in 1976 had a Pontiac Phoenix. They owned a bus, silver Pontiac Phoenix. How, what am I going to do with that? Yeah, I was so with a red interior. No kidding, I kid you not. Silver with a red interior. So when I went back and I looked at my whole life, and I still do it to this day, not to be egoic, but because I want to be the best version of myself. Like, I don't, if, if I get to meet all the other division and we get to hang out, I don't want you to show up pissed and angry and depressed. That's not the person I want to hang out with. I want to hang out with the best version of you. So for me, and my final answer is, ladies and gentlemen, even though we, I feel we're living in a prison plan, okay, is there a way to get out of this reality? There's no way to tell. There's a lot of these people, oh, I have this out-of-body experience. Yeah, but you're telling me the experience in this reality. So what the hell is a good out of an out-of-body experience? I think it's cool. Don't get me wrong. Taking cannabis and doing these mind-altering drugs, and all, I think it's cool to do that. But ultimately, if you want to tell the story to somebody, you got to tell them. In this reality, right? So this reality is all that matters. And when you figure out your code, being used or not, and you're living out your purpose, that's what matters. Some of you came here to fight the system. Some of you do that. See, for me, I wouldn't want to get that. I'm so glad I didn't get that code. I'm so glad I didn't get that code. It's a tough code to get. But I look at people that do it, and I, 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 I see beauty in that. I do. I see beauty in that. Like Donald John Trump, his, his life's not his own. Got one hell of a character. Alex Jones, I used to be a follower of the Who, who Fear Follow Infowars. I used to. Dude, I used to follow him. Now I look at him and I'm like, amazing kid. He's an actor. That's what you guys all are. You're all actors and actresses. Every single one of you, you're an actor or actress. Playing out your part, and the whole reality, the, the biggest joke of this reality, is that life's about looking good. Anybody here ever go to Landmark? Any Landmark So, the Landmark Forum was, it was a personal development course, and I'm a huge fan of that because Werner Erhard, who developed this course, you probably never heard it before, he, he, his whole thing was life's about looking good. And everything that you do in life pretty much is about looking good. 
And anything outside of your identity, you will try to prove wrong. Because you, got, you think you've got it all figured out. Now, if I laid all my truths out on the table, if everybody here got to come up and lay all your truths out on the table, can anybody honestly and authentically say that you've got everything figured out? <laughs> come on. You know you've got some things in there that are not right when it comes to one plus one equals two. But then there will be some things in there you'll justify because you do not want to be wrong. That's the human being experience, because you're being used, and whatever's using you, everything outside of you that's not part of you is wrong. And you'll sacrifice love just so you can be right, just to justify everything that you're doing in your reality. Think about that. Anytime, those of you that are in relationships, the next time you're out in an argument, I'll bet you're trying to be right. And you'll sacrifice love just to be right. That's what we do as human beings. Why do we do that? If we're supposed to all come together and be a big family, why do we try to prove everybody wrong outside of us? Because the identification of who you are is programmed a certain way. And we all have the golden age to the dark age. This entire reality goes off of that construct. If you guys, you can get the you in here. Anybody fan of the you guys? Yeah, the you so everything goes in the stage of the baby stage. And then as it moves through time, it gets darker and darker and darker until it finally reaches the death stage. And you can imagine that death, you know what death looks like? It's dark. It's way down. A baby all the way over here is looking at death it's like, dude, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> because I don't know anything. So ignorance is bliss with the baby. And this is exactly how our reality works, ladies and gentlemen. This is exactly how any architect works. The United States of America, since we're in here, was supposedly born in 1776. At that time when it was born at the Constitution, it was in its infant stages. And over time, it gets infiltrated, it gets darker, it gets darker, it gets darker. Until so now, it's in its death stage, it's ready to die. And we can all see that, right? You ain't gonna see me cheer when it goes down, huh? Not me. I won't cheer. Because I know it's all fixed. Just like every other empire. Every empire is being used to create this reality, and it's all harvesting their energy. This entire reality is built on one thing and one thing only, and that's called marketing. And that's exactly what each and every one of you do. Hey, my name's Logan, that's marketing. What do you do? Oh, I do this. That's marketing. Hey, you want my business card? You're constantly marketing to people. And the world around you is marketing to you. So just a, a few weeks ago, I did a decode on, uh, I called, let's talk about the war movie. Did, did anybody watch my war movie? Okay. So what's going on in the Middle East? It's a movie. Yeah. It ain't even real. Right? I know it's real. But let me just give you an analogy to take into consideration. When you watch a movie or a show on the telly or your phone, is it real? What do you mean, no? Are there really actors playing out their scripts? So is it real? Of course it is. But it's not real because it's being staged. So you just take that same example and you move it into the, what's going on over there. And you see, that thing that's going on over there, it's an archetype. And it wants your energy. And you know what it will keep you? Down here in the room shop. <laughs> this is where it will keep you. Because it wants to thrive off of the Mars energy. I decoded that war movie using astrology. And the map of astrology on October 7th, when they started that war, Mars was at the rising sign position. The rising sign position. Mars is the owner of the rising sign position. Everybody here has a number one house, and I hope all of you now that follow me, you know if somebody says, what's your astrological sign? Your answer should be, I'm all 12. You're all 12 houses. But Mars owns the first house. So Mars is the god of war, and this is where Mars was located on October 7th, 2023. And of course you have Jupiter there as well. So of course Jupiter is really known as a planet of Benefits. But Jupiter was in a position of the Aries, which is Mars. And this is so astrologically, this has a say in our reality. It's an archetype as well. 
My final answer with that, ladies and gentlemen, is that the stargate above you, the astrological wheel, is called the Great Beast. So if you want to bring theology into this, what is the Great Beast? Below, it's man, it's us. It's the 666. What is 666? It's you. It's carbon. Carbon has six protons, six electrons, and six neutrons. That's you. And what is the six tied to? Virgo the Virgin. What was Jesus born out of? A virgin. You are all, everybody here is having a Jesus Christ superstar experience. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And what is the Jesus Christ superstar experience? It comes with what's called a screenplay. And guess what your screenplay is? It's the cross that you've got to carry. And it's yours. So you don't need to defend it. Of course, most of you will not listen to that suggestion. You will defend your life because you get a payoff to be right. Okay? You don't need to defend it, you just need to own it. My position here, ladies and gentlemen, and my final answer is that you're not here to wake anybody up. That's not your job. Your job is to wake yourself up, become the best version of yourself, and then send a ripple out so everybody else around you can feel it. That's your job. Because if you're miserable, <laughs> your job, ladies and gentlemen, is to become a superstar. And you all have that as your birthright. Many, many gurus have done their whole personal development, second of my life, Bob Proctor, one of my big mentors. Um, and he was born to do what he was doing. Bob Proctor, 10 and 9, and 8, Bob Proctor fans. Um, if you, if you, listen, if you have financial trouble right now, if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you know just deep in that side, like I don't want to use anymore, there's a free YouTube. It's called Board Rich. Okay? Go watch it. Now, the thing is, is that 99% of you will only watch it once, and that's it. You gotta watch it over and over and over and over. See, the way you become prosperous in this reality is you practice your craft. Like Mozart, the great composer, they said he was composing in single digit age, like four or five. Do you think Mozart, do you think his parents made him practice? Of course. Probably hated his parents for making him practice so much. But, he became, but see, Mozart, I broke down the piano, I broke down Mozart, he was, it was his destiny to become this composer. He didn't have a choice. But he still practiced his craft. So that's what I do. I practice my craft. I'm addicted to decoding. That's all I do. I sit in a chair. I stare in front of the computer quite a bit, um, and this is a vacation for me. Like coming to the U.S. is a vacation. I even think I'm in Mexico. I come to the U.S. on vacation, <laughs> but it's true because I'm addicted to decoding. And my job is I'm a messenger. That's my job. I'm not perfect, right? Mercury, the Mercury, planet Mercury, is the messenger, and my in, in my tropical astrology, Mercury is my ruler. So if you watch my podcast, those of you that watch it, you know I got four or five hours, I can sit here and finish this whole thing off till 6 p.m. if I want. But I can go four or five hours, those are my average podcast, sitting in a chair, staring at a, a camera for five hours. Now this is amazing because I get real people here. This is this is amazing. Right? So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know all over the place, but my main message for you is, is that you're being used. My spirit. And spirit can come down and incarnate any time it wants into anybody. And there may just be, because like the Vedas say that we're all incarnations of God. Everybody. It's everything. So it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's just why I don't fight against the system. Because as I talked about from the golden age to the dark age, that's God. It can't be any other way. Because I study nature. And I have this big example, this analogy that I use about ladybugs. Remember, did everybody know how cute the ladybugs are? Yeah, you know cute little ladybugs. They're stone cold killers! <laughs> Seriously! I found that out because my mom is an avid rose bush collector. And she had aphids on a rose bush. So she ordered, you can order ladybugs on eBay. 
and put them on your garden. So anyway, I studied, I was studying nature. And I realized that the aphids chew on the rose bush leaves. And that's their food. And the rose bush is probably pissed at the aphids. And they, the rose bush probably thinks the aphids are the devil. And so the ladybugs come in, and the ladybugs become the savior for the rose bush. And the rose bush is like, that's my Jesus Christ. <laughs> right? That's how funny our reality is. You can take, take another look at your inside your body. You have an immune system. And the immune system has many different parts to it, killer cells, etc. But the job of the immune system is to defend the body against foreign invaders. Right? Simple. What does it defend against? Bacteria, parasites, pathogens. So the question I would have to all of you, we don't have to answer it, what created the bacteria, the parasites, and the pathogens? Well, if your answer is the devil, I don't know how you would justify that. Because you see, God creates the immune system with the intent knowing that there's going to be pathogens, bacteria, and parasites that they didn't So this system of a body is imperfectly perfect, as is our reality. My final answer on that is our reality is imperfectly perfect. Okay? It's imperfectly perfect. I learned this by watching a show called Ozarks. Yeah. Anybody ever see that show? Yeah. Amazing show, yeah. Great. Any Scorpio, if like, you're a Scorpio rising, you're going to freaking love the crime See what I mean about being perfect? So I remember that it was season four, episode 10, I would say. And Jason Bateman sit on the on the stairs outside, and they had just killed this guy. Yeah. And so the priest comes up, the priest of the cartel that killed this dude. And he sits down, and he's like, you want a cigarette? The priest is smoking. It's so funny. And, he, and so Jason Bateman ends up asking the priest, like, how do you do it? How do you do your work? And the priest says, I go around cold. And Jason David kind of was like really dumbfounded in that. How could you go where you're working for a killer? Same thing with the ladybug and the aphids and the rosebush folks. <laughs> because whatever runs this reality has a monopoly on it all. I know some of you don't agree with that. That's fine. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm just asking you to take it into consideration as a possibility. Start studying your body. Start studying the biology of the body. Start studying the microcosm where you have single cell organisms. And you're going to see this predator prey in the microcosm that you don't see. It's all predator prey in this reality. It's all imperfectly perfect. And your life's being used. So enjoy your life, folks. See, again, my really the big takeaway I want to get is that for those of you that are kind of on the fence of fighting the system, that's not fun. Not for me, it's not. Some people actually get off on that stuff. Like Alex Jones, he gets he loves doing that stuff. Right? But for me, it's not bliss, it's not fun. I learned a lot of that going to Mexico, and I live a very, I, I don't even own the car, I have a bike, I live a minimalistic lifestyle, I live two blocks from the beach, I live in paradise, right? But there's, it's a third world country, but it's beautiful. But through this minimalistic lifestyle, I learned so much about myself, I learned so much about how our reality operates. And through that, I realized that we live in a predator prey system. Ladybug, aphid. Aphid, rose bush. And the immune system has predator and prey with that as well, with the bacteria, allergies, etc., as I've already mentioned. Now, if you can wrap your mind around that, then you can take into consideration the possibility that your life's not your own. One day, everybody here, it's inevitable, you will face death. It took me, like, I was, I was raised to Jacob Jones' witness. Anybody next to GW or GW still working? Yeah, it's a few of you, right? Yeah. I was, I, I was born into it, and then I got out when I was 16. And my mom's 43 years old, and she's still doing it. But I had a great relationship with my mom. Because I, I tell her, I'm like, Mom, we're, 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 we're going towards the same thing. My past life is not, but I'm, I, I'm on the same team as you. I'm on the same team as you. So when I started studying religions because of my upbringing, I realized that all religions.
religions are owned and operated by the same boss. Christianity, Judaism, same boss. Islam, same boss. Who's Allah? The Son. The Son. Allah is the Son. So why are you going to fight? What's the fighting for? All the three main religions are in Israel anyway. You got Islam, Christianity, and Judaism all stuck in that holy center. And it's is Ra, Son God, El. Ra. When you do the numerology of Israel, you're going to eventually lead to the number three. With, because the big takeaway is Ra. In the minutes, it is three syllables. Is Ra El. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Israel. Same thing. It's funny because Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva equals 57 in your just like the word Shiva, the Shiva show equals 57. But anyway, that's where it differs from. I'm 57, and actually, there's a lot of correlations. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, but I'm telling you, it's really funny. So, uh, so Israel, and Ra is the big takeaway because Ra is, is the one that holds the scales. The scales of justice. You want to be the one holding the scale, not one of the scales. You want to be in the middle, which is why I suggest neutrality through to my audience. What is neutrality? Knowing that the bad, good, and bad are owned by the same boss. So why would you want to go fight against the system when you're just fighting against whatever created this reality? Because people will justify it by saying there's a boogie man running around about to get you. That's why. Because we've been indoctrinated by programming by if you were raised in a theological background, you were programmed with there's a boogie man running around. And there is one because people say so. That's that's just pure the magic is I say there's a devil, and just like that, I've created the boogie. That's how the church operates. The church is the good guy, and the devil's the bad guy. You can, the church would be useless if there was no looking at it. There would be no purpose for it. Right? No purpose for it. So realize, ladies and gentlemen, you are the good and bad. We're, we're human beings, as Landmark would say, we're all trying to be authentic, but we're not. We're inauthentic human beings. Trying to be authentic. Trying to put on this glorious actor and actress face of, I do no wrong. I don't make mistakes, it's your fault, not mine. And the reason being is because you don't want to look bad, you want to be right. And that's because whatever's using you, and anything outside of you, as I mentioned, you will not resonate with that, and you will try to put it down, and you will try to push it away. Some people you'll mess with. Like a lot of you here, you know, you probably met some people that you probably said you've been your soulmates. Like, what is a soulmate, right? They are female, it doesn't have to be the one. You have, the whole terminology of twin flames, but what is a soulmate? You know, it's your it's your family. It's your you're you're in a movie, folks, and you're you're the star of the show. Okay, you're the star of the movie, and then anybody that's part of your cast will be your family and your close friends. That's your cast, and then everybody else will just be extras in your movie. That's the way this works. And my, my, my really big thing with this, of the movie, and I'm going to really put all of you on a pedestal right now, because you all should be on a pedestal. This is not being ego right now. The reason why this reality exists is because you're born into it. When you die, the movie's over. Now, I know you would justify and say, well, there's a whole bunch of people on Earth that are they're going to still be, how do you know that? So we don't know what happens after we pass on from this reality. People are so like gung ho about, yeah, I can't wait to get on the other side. It's like, what if it sucks? <laughs> <laughs> what if this is a vacation spot for spirit? <laughs> you know, I have a deep note called the greatest show on earth. And you're in it. This is it. You are the, you're in the greatest show on earth. What are you doing with it? Are you complaining? Are you bitching? Are you pointing fingers that it's their fault, it's them, they did it? Or are you realizing that they and them, they're all working?
working as a unit to provide you the movie. And they're marketing to you. <laughs> they're marketing to you. The war movie right now is calling your name. Like, just turn on CNN and what's going on. You just got to know. I just got to know what's going on so I can go tell Billy Bob next door. <laughs> Why? Because you feel good about it. You get to be right. You get to be right. Yeah, that's what you do. And then you'll argue about it. No, it's Palestine. No, it's... And next thing you know, you're giving off this energy. See, this reality lives off of energy exchange. Your energy is being harvested. You're inside the earth is a battery and you're little cells. That's why they have cells in the body. You're in a pure battery, you're a little cell running around, creating energy. This whole reality is a battery. The matrix show that you're in a battery. It's a battery. The word battery in numerology equals 19. One and nine. You can't get more on those numbers than numbers. Okay? So you're in a battery and you're feeding the machine. Okay? The machine is where it's at. Welcome to the machine, Pink Floyd. Any Pink Floyd fans out there? <laughs> Dark Side of the Moon, 1973, Roger Waters. Decoded him. Had no choice. Roger Waters in that movie, Brain Damage, the song, I should say. He says, there's someone in my head, but it's not me. When you, do, you have to take my word for it, those of you that haven't seen my research, but when you, when you do that through alchemy, you'll see that it's tied to the implanted brain, which is heaven, and heaven is your thalamus. Okay? Heaven is your thalamus. Thalamus is the golden egg inside your brain. If you split your brain in half, you're going to see an all-seeing eye there, an Egyptian all-seeing eye. Most of you know that, right? If you split your brain in half, you'll see the all-seeing eye there. So there's big merit, there's big reference to um, the, the pyramids, you know, like I, my research kind of says that if those pyramids were destroyed, our reality would change. I know it's made of little science fiction, right? But I really believe that would be the case. I believe that the great pyramids of Giza are a portal for spirit to enter into this reality. I have a big deco coming out on Khufu, the great pyramid, and that's what my research shows. Spirit incarnates to the, to the pyramids, and it's a never ending cycle. Anybody see the show The 100 on CW? If you haven't seen the show of the 100, just go watch the first couple episodes. It's about 100 prisoners that are on an ark in space, and they get sent down to Earth after a nuclear apocalypse to make sure the Earth is inhabitable. The 100. Why 100? Well, it's interesting. Remember that 360 wheel I talked about earlier with the 138 being straight across from the 322? Well, 100 on that same wheel is across from 280. And what is the average birth span? What's the average pregnancy? 280 days. So two A's across from the 100 on that 300, yeah, well, I was right. There's so many different layers of this reality when you observe it. And when you get down into this hole, as I've gone, it gets very golden. <laughs> Everybody know that it gets very golden, right? It does because it's like, how do you even have a conversation with somebody? Right? Because they're looking at you like you're nuts. I think you've got to be insane in this same world. I think this world's insane. I think we're insane. <laughs> but when you get down in that rabbit hole of decoding, you'll realize that it's a very horrible place. And you've got to start to reach out, branch out, and you've got to get, I feel like you need to own loneliness. Any of you that are in a relationship, you see, if you're in that relationship, I, I say that that person should compliment you. You don't need to be with that person. Some of you may be codependent, right? It's just part of your program. You gotta work on it. It's not a bad thing. Every time someone says, oh, you shouldn't be codependent, or there's a book on how to cure this, you instantly program yourself to it's bad, or I got something wrong with me. Let me just tell you, every single one here, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah, nothing wrong with any of you. You're exactly where you need to be right now. And you chose to be here. Just bring that out. <laughs> so I guess I'll just finish this. So Jason, you wanna give me something to, to go off some kind of number? Hey, get off the stage. Go get off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everybody. Appreciate it.
Mais t'as eu tant mieux que t'as gagné que... Thank <laughs> you. 
It's called Flying Serpents and Dragons. And in this book, it gives the history of Ari Boy, this U.S. cryptologist. This man was a genius, a mathematician, a scientist. And basically, he was a spook. He was a spy. But this, this man also had a passion. And he put together a chronology of the world based off the data that was available to the U.S. intelligence agencies. This amazing chronology holds that two, two points. One is that if anybody is going to accurately construct a model of world history and be able to synthesize all the different timekeeping systems, there's only one, one event in world history that is going to be able to do that. And that you're going to have to fix the date of the Exodus. This man went through the material and found out that it wasn't just Israelites that fled Egypt. It was the Canaanites, Danaans, or largely the Turians. Something so terrible happened in northern Africa that every culture that was doing business in the maritime trade empire had to get out. And they left. And different Bronze Age civilizations all based their calendars and their, and their timekeeping systems, their chronologies. Their chronographers actually said such and such event happened in the 57th year after the departure or the, or the, the uh, exodus or however they termed it. But so many of these chronographers were found by this, this guy who worked the national, uh, the, was a national security agency, no, national space agency, I'm sorry. This cryptologist reported that according to his finds, when he had entered all these into a computer, it conclusively showed that all these calendars and timekeeping systems and records pinpointed that the Exodus event, that's also mentioned in the biblical narrative, happened in the year 1447 BC. So, I'm not going to argue with a cryptologist, but I'm going to tell you that this is only a data point. We can be impressed with his information. We can be impressed with the fact that he had an accessibility to all this information. We can be impressed with the fact that U.S. intelligence agencies still can We can be impressed with all that. It's still a data point. This is not that sad. But it becomes more when we find out that a historian, he wasn't even really a historian, but his name is Emmanuel Velikovsky. Many of you know the name. He wrote Ages in Chaos, Worlds in Collision. He's written several books. One of the most vilified and hated authors of the 20th century. And it's because what he published was completely antithetical to anything scholars and academics could agree on. He too was a chronologist. He, too, using totally different data, determined that a massive event that started an exodus of cultures from Egypt occurred that was attached to the silk almanacs of ancient China, where it was described that a comet with ten tails appeared in the sky. This is a, I can't pronounce it, you guys already know, I'm ready, I don't know, I can't pronounce the silk, the silk of one the almanacs. That's my best attempt. But Emmanuel Velikovsky published in his books for anybody to see. And I'm pretty sure Paul, as a matter of fact, I got some Velikovsky Bell yesterday from him. He published this event happened in 1447 BC. And Emmanuel Velikovsky doesn't know anything about R.A. He doesn't know anything about what the cryptologist would do. Again, that's not what that he said. Those are two independent data points. So you can call it coincidence. So we'll move on. Dr. Teal. Dr. Teal is also a chronologist. Dr. Teal did not like Emmanuel Velikovsky, but they did agree. Dr. Teal wrote a fantastic book that is studied today by many people. It is called The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings. In that book, Dr. Teal he provides data sets. He overwhelms you with chronological data showing all the kings of Israel, showing what was happening internationally in other countries. But when 
gets to the Exodus, it's very clear the Exodus happened in 1447 BC. This is the third data point. That's not a data set, but it's becoming more and more convincing. I have mentioned many times that I'm very impressed with a Christian chronologist. His name is Stephen Jones. Now, Stephen Jones won't, won't correspond with me. I have attempted twice. I'm not offended. He doesn't like my output, but that's okay. I have cited him numerous times anyway. Stephen Jones used the Assyrian eponyms, the Book of Jasher, the Book of Jubilees, and the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Using just a little analyzing the chrono markers in those texts, Stephen Jones specifically wrote that the Exodus could have happened in no other year than 1447 BC. Anybody, anybody really interested in biblical chronology? You need to see it. But his book is called The Secrets of Time. It's fantastic. That's not a bad set, but it's getting closer to it. So, another thing of significance that Stephen Jones brings to the table is that he studied the text and all refer to the Alexandrian scribes. The chronologies of, of the early Christian authors were all of a sudden in the 7th century AD. It seemed that every Christian author knew of a calendar that no one had ever heard of. But they all cited it. It was the Anno Mundi calendar. In Latin, it's Annus Mundi. But this calendar was supposedly counting back to a terrible event, an event that was so horrific that humans had believed that time started over. It was a countdown to the very next time that the world was going to start over. This Anno Mundi calendar is very interesting. It pops up in Masonic chronologies, in the Wood Manuscript, in the Inigo Jones Manuscript of 1610, in the Masonic Constitution of 1735, everything is dated using the Anomundi calendar. Stephen Jones published that according to his calculations, the Exodus event of 1447 BC was also the year 2448 in Ovid. And this is where things get really interesting. Because now we're leaving the realm of data points and we're about to enter a death set. Let me explain. Engineer David Davidson in 1924 wrote a book, The Great Pyramid, Our Divine Inheritance. It's a fantastic book. It's very technical. I have shown you guys in that book where he shows a geometrical calendar encoding the base diagonals of the Great Pyramid, and he didn't know why. He doesn't even speculate. But he said that there's a timeline encoding the Great Pyramid, and it ends the final year of that timeline is 2045. He, didn't, he doesn't even know why. He never even speculated. His book is fantastic, it's over 600 pages. It's another book. It's another book that I got from Paul Tice. Now, in this book, there is hundreds of data points on the chronology of the world. David Davidson never said that the Exodus occurred in 1447 because he wasn't using that calendar. He said, according to the ancient world's calendars, the Exodus event happened in the 2448th year of the world. This is saying the precise, the precise thing Stephen Jones is saying, but from a totally different mathematical vantage point. We can leave it there, but we have another problem, and that's Rashi. 900 years ago, a Jewish scholar and mathematician and a chronologist, he too calculated the Exodus event at 2448 of the year of the world. There isn't a single mention 
in any Jewish authors 900 years ago of the existence of the Jewish calendar. None. I have, I have challenged you. On my YouTube channel, I have challenged people to produce the evidence that a Jewish calendar is a thing of fact. Show me the sources. Show me any ancient books that refer to a Jewish calendar. I'm not worried about that debate because you're not going to find it. The Jewish calendar is a fiction. It was specifically created by rabbis to confuse Christians in the basically chronological analysis. And it is, it is as admitted to in the Tom Levin text. They brag about it. Moses Maimonides brings more to the table. Before I hold on, before I jump, I don't want to jump yet. Yeah, I don't want to jump yet. Most of you know and have heard of Archbishop James Usher. 361, 362 years ago, he published Annals of the World. Archbishop James Usher said that Moses lived and Cadmus took his people and fled from Egypt in the Exodus in the year 2448. This is a chronologist, Archbishop James Usher. Again, that's the third reference to 2448. And we already have a bridge with Stephen Jones showing that 1447 is the year 2448. So having no idea, knowing that the Exodus was 1447 BC, not knowing that 2448 NL Moody is also the Exodus with an entirely different timekeeping system. Two authors produced a book, again, a book I got from book trade, called The Orion Prophecy. And in that book, here's two names, Patrick Gerald and Gino Ratinis. I probably misspelled, mispronounced that same name. These two men produced the data showing that in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, there is a symbol for cataclysm. And that symbol is also a number in Egypt, and it is 2448. They had no idea about the chronology of the Exodus or the comet of Tin Tales. They did not know. So, with taking these things into consideration about the Exodus, we have to return to Rashi because Rashi says something else that's profound. It's also a chronological statement, and he said that by the Western world's calendar, B.C. A.D. Abraham's birth was in 1947 B.C. This is really interesting. Rashi was a Jewish father. He's not going to do anything to promote Christianity. But over and over in his chronological studies, he's saying the exact same thing Christian authors were saying about different dates for different biblical events. In Talmud Sanhedrin 97a, Rashi Leviticus Rabbi 291, it is specifically stated the birth of Abraham was 1947 BC. This can't be stressed enough because of what then the book of Jasher, the Midrashic text, and the book of Genesis, well, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are very specific and how they outline chronological history in the old world. Moses Maimonides agreed 1947 BC was the birth of Abraham. Elijah Schumann, the sequence of events of Old Testament dates, it's an epic book. If you're not a chronologist or have no interest in chronology, that book will burn the shit out of you. But it's good. 1947 BC was the first, was Abraham's birth. Biblical chronologist Stephen Jones, not Jewish, he never quotes Moses Maimonides, he doesn't quote Rashi, he doesn't care. He only quotes the coral markers in the book of Jasher. And he determined 
Det er på nogle af de nogle tider, hvor sidder på PC. You have to understand, in many of you do, I'm not trying to be constant. We're talking about different time periods, different researchers using different, different sources of data. Some of them are writing in different languages, and they're all saying the exact same thing. Cedar Olam has the Exodus event 500 years after the birth of Abraham. Cedar Olam is the only authority in chronological materials of, of the Jewish scholars. If 1947 BC was the birth of Abraham, 500 years later is 1447 BC. This is the data set. We have gone full circle from multiple different materials to show the exact same thing. And of course, I'm not. Book 1, chapter 6, Antiquities of the Jews, it is 18 and a half centuries old. Flavius Josephus, who is basically a traitor to the Jews, who became a faith of the Roman equestrian founder. He wrote a chronology as well. And he specifically stated that Abraham was born 292 years after the Great Flood. If that's the case, then it's very easy to date the Great Flood. 292 years before 1947 BC is 2239 BC. For those of you who have followed my Phoenix research, you will know that 2239 BC was an epic disaster. Every Bronze Age civilization collapsed. It was the collapse of the Vapor King. And of course, I'm not So, this is how easy it is to construct what you are in today. Rashi, Moses Maimonides, Stephen Jones, Ari Boy. Um, I'm, 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 not, I'm not naming them all, there's a lot more. But there are so many historical records that tell us the pre flood world was 1656 years that I don't need to prove it to you. Anybody can find this. It is universally accepted that 1656 years was the length of the pre flood world. So, in 2239 BC was the great flood, the day the sky fell, the collapse of the vapor canopy, our Noahic flood. In 292 years was the birth of Brahma, you know, Abraham. Brahma and Saraswati are the original. The Jewish redacted version is Abraham and Sarai. But 292 years was the birth, which was 500 years before the Exodus in 1447 BC. U.S. cryptologist Ari Boulay was dead accurate when he said, only by fixing the date of the Exodus will we ever get an accurate year where we're at today. Enjoy. This thing's not acting right. 1656, years of the pre flood world. My arcade's better than you already know. It brings you to 3895 BC, year one of the Great Pyramid timeline. 3895 BC is a Phoenix year, just like 1656 years later, in 2239 BC, another Phoenix year. You just can't make up this type of this type of synchronicity. Just can't be made up. It can't. It can't be arbitrary. It's too well documented, and there are no other historical documents that provide an alternate chronology that can be put together and sourced together and made to this type of synthesis. So putting these chronological facts together, we have 3895 BC as year one. That's not the beginning of this world. But something happened to make the survivors think that it was the beginning of the new heavens and new earth. Something happened. Genesis tried, Genesis tried to give us the details. Adam and Eve reset, something terrible. Call it bullshit, whatever. 
Something happened to where the survivors believed it was a new heavens and new world. 1656 years later, it was 2239 BC. 1947 BC was 292 years after that. 500 years after that was the Exodus 1447 BC. And if the Exodus of 1447 BC is also 2448 and a wound, there's no other way than to conclude that 2023 and old dominion today is the year 5917. Meaning, we have 83 more years to get our shit together. <laughs> so, so the takeaway here is really simple. It is very easy, and I, what I gave you, what I gave you was a very simplified data set. What I can do is pack it with all the other historians and all the other chrono marks and all the other texts to provide more and more proof for what I just gave you. And I'll do that in a book, but as far as the data set, it's unbreakable. That is an absolutely perfect mathematical construct to show us we're in the year 5917. We have 83 more years until a similar event in Genesis occurred, which was a recent event so catastrophic that mankind was literally put into the position of be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth because they had no other alternative to be wiped out. So, a lot's going to happen before 83 years alive. The month of May 2040, it's not near as bad as you think. It's nowhere near as bad as you think. Disasters happen every single year. Maybe not tsunamis, maybe not earthquakes, but they happen. Regional populations are taken out, the rest of the world continues. This happens all the time. 2040 is a depopulation by 25%, meaning there's a 75% survival rate. 2046 is one part of that, meaning from May 2040 to November 1st, the day of the day, 2046, 50% of the world's population will no longer exist. That by that time, that's still going to leave 8 billion people. It's a reset. But it's not an extension level event. So this is this was a data set. I provide hundreds of them in my research published books on my videos, in my private notes on my phone guys. It's, it's just what I like to do. Data sets are boring as hell. But they're unbreakable. This is why. And I'm pretty sure some of them will listen to me, but this is why Billy Carson, Randall Carson. Grand Hancock. In all that entire league of, of authors, this is why they're not going to debate Jason and Arcades. Not for any type of intellectual superiority, but because without data sets, you're just theorizing. And as long as you're just theorizing, somebody with a modicum of intelligence will know you're blowing smoke up their ass. <laughs> That's what it's about. These men are not equal to their books. If someone cannot defend the integrity of their research, then we have to question who we handed them those manuscripts because they weren't written by them. I do have a theory. Yeah. I do not believe. I do not believe Grant Hancock wrote those books. I do not hear the intellect in his, in his discourses in, on Netflix, when he's talking to people on podcasts, the man that I am verbally listening to is not the individual who wrote that text. That's my theory. And it's going, and it's, to me, it's factual until the man steps up and defends the integrity of his material. Until it happens, I'm going to keep calling him out. Until that happens, but the course of the fraud, I'm going to keep calling him out. Until that happens, Randall Carson, uniformitarian, 
is just a recovery of fraud and we keep calling them out to This is the difference between theory and data set. Listening to it verbally is nowhere near as impressive as seeing it in writing. When you see it in writing and follow with the calculator, there's no way to break it. So tonight, when we, make, when we get back to our Airbnb, I'm going to pull out my laptop and I'm going to publish the entire data set that I just read to you. You can download it as a free PDF in the description box or in the comment. You can share it with anybody who wants to debate the subject. But the reason all these call outs are not being answered is because these men have been lying to all of us. And they've been doing it for a very long time. And they've been getting away with it. Because until this time, no one has yet taken seriously the science of chronology. And this is what our case is all about. If, I, if you can't see it in the numbers, you're full of shit. That's my presentation. Israel. The war 
against Hamas. There is no war against Hamas. There is no war against Gaza because it takes two armies to have a war. It takes two militaries to have a war. It actually takes two countries to have a war. Israel and Palestine is the one country. This whole thing that's going on at the moment, I mean, it's kind of quite predictable they're going to do something like this. Ukraine is running out of steam. Ukraine has just basically been a big money laundering operation. That's all it's been about. It's been depopulating the young people of Ukraine so they could be replaced, which is happening right around the world. They're even drafting pregnant women now in Ukraine. New body armor for pregnant women. Isn't that thoughtful? Body armor for pregnant women. So they're clearing the population out of Ukraine. I would suggest that a lot of people from Israel are going to be moving up to Ukraine. But what's happening in Israel and Gaza right now, a lot of people might not know there's been a lot of um, pushback against the jab and all this sort of stuff happening in Israel. They're pretty much on the verge of civil war. Babies are very, very unpopular prime minister and are pretty much on the verge of civil war and suddenly this big incursion happens. Hamas invades Israel. On the most secure border in the world, there's no way can a cockroach get through that border without the Mossad and IDF knowing. And somehow we have all these Mossad, I mean, all these uh, Hamas raiders on paragliders and things. You know, how do you even build a paraglider in Gaza? I actually went into Gaza Strip in 2012 and crawled through the tunnels and got in there myself. Just to have a look, and uh, you can't get anything in Gaza. I was trying to put school desks for the kids. I couldn't even get nails in Gaza. So how are they going to get paragliders in there? I don't know. You can't even get crowns in Gaza for the kids. It's ridiculous. And this whole concept of them sailing over the wall in paragliders and blowing up the wall and coming through in tractors and all this sort of shit. All the military was stood down that day. All the video footage that you see of the so-called paragliders as well are actually parachutes. Yeah. You need a plane for a parachute. All these paragliders just went up there and dropped all these people off the back of their paragliders. You know? This whole thing has been staged by so you can go and ethically cleanse Gaza, which is what they're doing. Yeah. A lot of people think you're over mass fighting back, all this sort of stuff. Gaza is 2.3 million people. They hold in an area four and a half miles wide at the wide point. Most of it is two miles wide, 25 miles long, 2.3 million people. For a war around it or the ocean sealed off, you can't get anything in and out of Gaza. Nothing at all. And the average age in Gaza Strip is 17. Over half the population is aged under 15. 75% of the population is 25 or younger. Okay, and you're waging a war against these people. Hamas is a government that was put in place by Israel to do exactly what it's doing to create this whole instability that it's creating now, and they're going to go in and genocide these people if we let them do it. You know, that's why I watched it as it's happening. I've often said that um, Palestine is the greatest moral dilemma we face in the world today. It, it is. And what it is is a system of surplusing and warehousing human beings. You have your 15 minute cities, that's West Bank, that's what it'll end up being, that's what they bring in, in all of our countries. And now they're trying to kick off this whole World War III scenario through what they're doing in Gaza Strip. I mean, a lot of the protests around the world, you've seen millions of people protesting what's going on. And the passive media portraying it, they're saying these are hate filled supporters of the mass terrorist organization. No, they're not. They're people who are protesting the genocide and slaughter of 2.3 million innocent people over 1 million children in the Gaza Strip. But they're promoting, promoting it as anybody who's supporting this or supporting hate, or supporting terrorism, or supporting Hamas. You know, and meanwhile, all this has been going on. Like, what happened in Europe? All the migrants and all the invaders into Europe. What's happening in the United States here? How many migrants have come in secretly, been put up in five star hotels in San Francisco, in LA, in New York? It's happening right around the world. A lot of these people are very sympathetic towards going on in the Middle East, very sympathetic towards Palestine, as most people who think are. Uh, you know. But all these people have been embedded in all of our countries. 
And I've often said the only way you ever get to bring down the United States is to bring it down from within. Which doesn't mean you get a corrupt government in there that does it that way. That helps if they do, and they are. But the way they're doing it is they're destroying the country literally from within by bringing these migrants in and by changing the legislation, changing the laws, Black Lives Matter, all of this sort of stuff. You know, Black Lives Matter turned into what they did to Seattle when you had that, that no go zone they created in Seattle. Now there's legislation coming in, in the country where you can go to any place and you can just rob it. And if it's under a thousand dollars worth of stuff you've stolen, they won't even call the police. This is happening all around the, the country. I was in San Francisco a few weeks ago. Most of the shops in the center of town are closed. Everything that made San Francisco, San Francisco is gone. So there you go. People all over the street, you know, Trank and, and, and whatever these new drugs are that they're, they're bringing out. The street fights that you see at next level, like not just street fights anymore. You know, if someone starts punching someone else, three or four people jump in to, to beat up some one person. If they manage to get you down on the ground, they try to kill you. They stamp on your head, they body slam, you know, it's next level stuff that's going on in the streets out there right across the country. You know, in the last couple of months, I've been to San Francisco, I've been to Philadelphia, I've been to Miami, I've been to New York, I've been to a lot of places that I've seen this for myself. So this is what's happening to the United States. You know, as soon as you won't have any food stores because people are going and rampaging through these stores, it's just breaking down the whole system. And that's how they're destroying the United States from within. And we're getting to a situation that's going to be a clash of cultures because of they brought all these people in to do this. And so we need to really take stock of what's going on. What, they, what they're doing in the Middle East, they're trying to kickstart this in all our countries, in all of Europe as well. People, I mean, seriously, you guys have got to do something. You've got to rise up and you've got to hold your government to account. You've got to encourage everybody to do it. And it's got to happen right around the world. The only way you can say what's going on in Europe is for everybody in Europe to hold their governments to account to stay up and reclaim their countries. Every country in Europe needs to close their borders, they need to get out of the EU. We don't need to fill out paperwork and sign all. We're getting out of the EU today. Thank you. Goodbye. It's as simple as that. That's why it needs to be done. And it needs to be done in this country as well. It needs to be done everywhere. And I've often said Gaza Strip is the key. You can, if you save Gaza, you can save the world. I put out a video in 2015 saying save Gaza, save the world, because the very existence of Gaza Strip is a war crime. It's a breach of Article 33 of the Fortune Convention. It's collective punishment. It's an open war crime that's been supported by every single sitting politician in the world, which means that every sitting politician in this country is breaking the law of the United States by supporting war crimes. Therefore, the government is invalid. Their position is invalid. They are in abuse of the office they hold, and they can be dismissed today. There's no debate about this. You know, so with what's going on now in Gaza Strip, they're saying this is we're defending ourselves. No, you're not. You're ethnically cleansing the Gaza Strip. You staged this attack yourself. There's no way this was done by Hamas. This was done by Mossad. And it's done as a false flag attack in order to institute ethnic cleansing and genocide being supported by all of our politicians. Which means that they're all guilty of treason, they're all guilty of breaking the law in their own country, they can be dismissed today. There's no question of this. The people just have to rally up and do it. You know, we're facing the biggest spiritual and moral dilemma and moral test of our existence. All these resets that happen, if you want to get a little bit esoteric about all this, you know, all these resets happen, as Jason said, possibly over 138 years that quickly. I don't think any of the technology we're using is new. I don't think anything, there's nothing new under the sun. They do the same thing every time. But I believe, I would suggest that every time they do one of these resets, there's a way we can get out. There's a moral dilemma that's put right in front of our face, and we have the ability to heal it, and in doing so to heal the world. And in this reset, that moral dilemma is Palestine, most especially the Gaza Strip. You know, we can stand up and we can call this for what it is. And just, I'd like to see it like a massive strike right around the world. Everyone just stop what you're doing and call these politicians out. But I think this is, this is our opportunity. And Gaza is our opportunity. Palestine is our opportunity. 
And if we fail to heal the wrong dilemma that is Palestine, as I've said so many times, the way of Palestine will be the way of the world. Because we allow this to happen. We sat there and let this happen on our watch. It's been going for 75 years, and it's about to culminate in the next couple of weeks. It's been really hard for me. I haven't been sleeping. I've been having a really rough time through this. I mean, not as much as the people in Gaza, of course. But I have friends there that I chat to quite often, and it's really difficult going online and you know, watching my friends and knowing that I'm probably watching them die right in front of me. You know, what Israel has done to the place is it's like nothing they've ever done to the place before. And they're presenting everything as backwards, the same as being in the humane, or open the borders so they can get out. And they've bombed all the borders so no one can get out. They've, they've cut all the water off, they've cut all the power supply off, power supply off. They've got it all really done so they can go in and just brutalize these people. And what we're dealing with here are Bolsheviks, okay? Bolshevik Jews, that's who runs Israel. Uh, has anyone looked into Bolshevism here? Few people have we know what we're dealing with. These are the most evil people in history. The Bolsheviks killed between, I don't even know what the numbers are, killed between 66 and 135 million Russians in a variety of creative ways, whatever way they can think of, it's the new way we can kill someone because they got war with them. That's who's running the world, and they intend to exact the vengeance on the world because they've been kicked out of so many countries all through Europe. Everyone knows that these guys have created a lot of trouble. The Jews get the blame for it, of course, but it's a particular breed of Jews. You can't blame all the Jews. You know, that's a common thing. You just can't. They're very, very programmed people, but that, that's who, if you really look into what Bolshevism is and what it did, exact the worst genocide of all, the most brutal, horrid murders of all in all living history. That's who is in charge of the world at the moment. And the fact that nobody knows this, nobody knows about the history of Bolshevism, is a very good indication that that's who is in charge of the world. And they want to see the whole world just eat itself. They want to see this clash of cultures. So we need to nip this in the bud. And I don't have all the solutions for it either. I, mean, I don't, it's all very well for me to say, well, we need to hold our governments to account. We need to rise up. Well, yeah, we do. Well, yeah, we needed to do this 20 years ago. Right. Yeah. You are? Yeah. Yeah, well, back in 2008, I remember saying World War Three has already started. It's a war of depopulation. It's been waged by the governments, the war against the people of the world. They're going to use food as a weapon. They're going to use vaccines as a weapon. All the stuff that they've done now. When the Christchurch shooting happened in 2019, I said that this is the beginning of the final move of the end game. And if we don't expose what actually just happened with Christchurch, how they're going to use it to censor us and kick us off, kiss off all these platforms and things, kick me off YouTube. Like I'm banned everywhere now, freaking everywhere. <laughs> it's crazy. Like Facebook, YouTube, I iTunes, LinkedIn. An iHeart, SoundCloud, everything. It's crazy. They let me back on Twitter, I don't know why. <laughs> but so I got a kick like the band from there all the time. But um where was I going? I was going to do something with that. My mid way folks. But um <laughs> Christchurch, yeah, when Christchurch happened, I said this is the beginning of the final move of the end game. If you can think of 9 11 as being the beginning of the end game, the first move of the end game, Christchurch was the beginning of the final move of the end game. They're getting used to censor us all, lock us into our echo chambers. And I said, if we don't deal with what's happening with Christchurch and expose us for what it is, because it's all there on the shooter's video, it shows you the government did this. It shows you media collusion, it shows you police collusion. It's all that bad video so quickly. It was so sloppy. It shows you what MK Ultra really looks like, how Tavistock Institute runs its assassinations. It's all there on the video. I said, if we don't expose this, I expect the world to go into lockdown within 12 to 18 months. And that was in March 2019. The world went into lockdown in March 2020. And we've been in pretty much in our lockdown state ever since, which they're now morphing into climate change, blah, blah, blah. Now they're bringing world terrorism back into it. But this is a huge moral dilemma, and it's, it's, it's like a, 
It's like a soul harvest. A lot of what they do here is they want to harvest your soul. They want that energy. They want that life force from you. And here we've got the genocide of 2.3 million people, mainly children, can be live streamed on TV. Everyone sitting there eating their popcorn, watching the bombs fall while they're cheering on. What's that doing to the collective soul? Think about this, you know. And what is the internet, the World Wide Web, the internet, the international net, the web? What do they do with this stuff? It's a trap, it's a soul trap, this whole thing. It's what we give our attention to, what we give our energy to. You know, I still believe we have a chance to heal this. How? I don't know from this point, but I like to believe in the human race. And when I started doing this, I really started speaking out like back when the 9 11 attacks happened. 9 11, it was so obvious. Why did they make it so obvious? They could have made it so that we, we didn't know that we actually believed the official story, but they made it so obvious. Why? Fish against the socks. They wanted to find all you guys. I want to find everybody who can think who aren't the NPCs. Because half the people here, I think, aren't even people. They're just avatars. They're just consciousness driving an avatar. It's like Westworld. They don't realize that they're not real people, but they're not. You know, half the fun for the controllers is finding the real people. It's like my needle in a haystack. You know, the psychopaths, this is the way they think. They want to have fun in their slaughter. You know? So they put out this stuff, put out an online, they can create the web, and then they go fishing and find out who the real people are. Because that's who souls they want to get, that's who they want to track. With the jab as well, it's all connected, it's all connected folks. You notice how people are changing with the jab? All this, like I said, all this weirdness, all this weird violence sounds, strange people, like really pretty strange people. And now you don't know what a woman is? <laughs> Okay, but you identify as a woman, do you? What the fuck is it that you identify if you don't know what a woman is? Where are we going with this? You know? And it's all perfectly normal for people. It's incredible. You see stuff you've just never dreamed that you'd seen. And if you told me this back in 2019, that in 2023, this is where the script of the movie was going to go, there's no way I would have believed it. But now I'm all out of the theater. This is too unbelievable. You know? But here we are. You know, and now we've got this whole situation going on in Palestine and in Gaza. You know, and if we allow them to slaughter these children, well, what does that make us? What does that make us? It's all very well for just trust to just offer lip service and, and talk about this and, and you know, whatever. But there's got to be some action we can take. So I firmly believe that like, if people just start talking, put your minds together and think about it. Stop complying with anything that causes you to step outside your moral compass. We can change it. You know, whatever that will be, whatever the solution is. It's a thing though, you know, if I don't have all the ideas, I don't have all the solutions. I've done what I can for, for 20 years now, 30 years. Just trying to empower people into preventing this situation from ever happening. But here, here it is, we're here now. You know, I really hope that we never get here, but here we are. But everything that ever has gone wrong in the world, everything that's wrong in the world now, all the problems that we face, generally legislated to exist, it's interesting. But all of the problems, anything good that's ever happened, that's bad that's ever happened, that's been a creation of man, has ultimately come from the spark of an idea and a single mind. Someone's had that idea, they put it in action, and everyone else has gone along with it. Well, I believe if I put this message out there, someone's going to have that idea. They go, oh, this. And they're going to put it out there, and then people are going to go along with it. You know, and I don't have all the answers, I don't have all the solutions, I just don't. I can see what the problems are, though, and I can see that we are at one of the most crucial times in all history. Even if these resets happen the way Jason says, and the way people say, and things go in cycles the way they say, I think we're getting to the end of these cycles. I really do. I think if we don't get our shit together, with this reset, with, with this situation we're in now, perhaps there won't even be another one after this. You know, it's really that important. It's really that important. And if you ask someone who believes in the legal system, you believe this whole fiction is real, this whole matrix is real, well, like I said, well, if you believe in the legal system, Gus is the key. That's the key to the legal situation as well, because the mere existence of Gus is true 
renders all of their system invalid, all of their words invalid, everything that they are is invalid. And it shows that they're all criminals. You know, if we're letting criminals make our laws for us and run our lives, what's going on with us? Because you know, we never grew up, we were taught just to be children. We thought we need to ask permission for everything that we do. Everything we say, everywhere we go, everything that we want to do with our lives. Gee, is it okay for me to do this? Of course it's okay, just freaking do it. You know? I've always believed that it's a lot easier to get forgiveness than permission, so I always just kind of wish it, you know? <laughs> they don't really forgive me anyway, but I don't care, I don't really talk to them about it, I just do it anyway. You know? And it's kind of worked out well for me. So maybe this is a time that we all need to grow up, folks. Maybe this is a time when we really need to just grow up and say no. Even with everything we're facing, all the shops closed and all this shit going on, what about we just support each other and support ourselves? Even like cash, I am another yourself. I've tried to say this to people for 20 years on the radio show. And it's the same even with these events and things. You know, you come to these events and it's good to come and get speakers and meet people and blah, blah, blah. But everybody in the room here thinks the same as you do. What about the little vibes that you get with people? Connect with them, write their numbers down, write their names down, create your own great communities. Look at all these people here that live in San Diego. They all have some sort of action community. You could form your own local government, take over the council that you've got, kick them the fuck out of the building, and turn this back into a proper city doing what you can. And you've all got arts in the right place. If you believe the system's real, perhaps go down that way. Maneuver us into a position where we can reduce the size of government more and more and more to the point that we don't need them at all. Because we really don't. You know, but you know, that's what I mean. We have the ability to change things. When we come to these places, we do these meetings, we think it's really cool, we have great days, we change the world of going out and doing this. No, you didn't. But you've got an opportunity to do it. You could probably, the amount of people in this room, you could probably replace almost the entire freaking government of California with this amount of people. You know what I mean? If you just had that year in your focus, then you can lead by example for the rest of the country. And they go, hey, they just did. Let's do that shit, you know? There's a village, there's a town in uh, Mexico called uh, Caron. And they figured out that um, the police and the governors where all the criminal activity came from, so they threw them out of town. And they just took over the whole town themselves. They've got militia that looks after things. If there's any problem, all the militia takes care of it. And it's the most honest and decent and best place to live in Mexico. Because they keep going out. When the COVID stuff happened, there's a set town called San Pancho, which is not near Sayulita, just north of Puerto Vallarta in, in Mexico. They wanted to lock the town down for the COVID restrictions. The mayor of the town said, You want to lock the town down. They mysteriously found him dead in his kitchen the next day. The head school teacher in town said he wanted the school kids to wear masks. They found him on the bench the next day with his head cut off. Then the local council said, No, we're not going to lock down, said Pencho. We're just going to close the, the, the roads in and out. And just, just don't go in and out for two weeks and just go about your business. I like that sort of attitude. That's the way things get done. You know? So they say Mexico is a dangerous place, but at least if you're a bad person, you know, because they don't mess around with police or anything, they just take care of you if you're a bad person. So don't be a bad person, it's pretty, it works pretty well, you know. So I mean, there's, there's ways around this place, but that's what I mean, you know, we've got the ability, enough people here, but people kind of timid, that they're scared of being themselves, they're scared of really wanting to meet people and open up to people, they're embarrassed of what someone might think about them or whatever. Don't be about that. Don't be like that at all. I mean, you've all got something to offer. Like I said, everything that ever happened, fantastic or bad, anything that's it's the result of human achievement in any way, ultimately came from the idea in the, in the mind of a single individual. Might have been some little booty guy in a wheelchair. You know, like you say, hey, let's do this shit. And someone else says, hey, that's a great idea. Let's do that. That's something the whole world's doing. It's really that simple, folks. So don't sell yourself short. You know, I'm living proof. Like, I'm a freaking nobody. You know, I've spent most of my life smoking weed, playing guitars, playing in little shitty rock bands in Adelaide, Australia. What the fuck am I doing here? In 2012, I actually crawled through the tunnels into Gaza Strip myself because I wanted to check it out. 
You didn't even tell the master we were coming. We just went there, found some rebels, got in through the tunnel. You know? And people are going, why are you in the house? I'm like, I just want to have a look, you know? And I'm crawling through the tunnel. I'm like, 50 meters underground, but I was just in the tunnel. So this stop. And then it's like a mile long, it was over an hour to get through this tunnel. And we're just exhausted. And I'm crawling through it. And I'm thinking, well, like, I'm under Rafa border, 50 meters below ground. And there's a war going on between Gaza and Israel. One bomb on this border crossing, this tunnel's coming down. I'm buried 50 meters below ground. No one's even going to be looking for a body down here. You know, I'm gone. I'm not hurt of ever again, you know. And I started giggling. <laughs> I just saw a load of fucking guy. What's the chances of me, this, this smoking guitar player, what am I doing here? You know? And then when we went into Gaza, and I was there for 10 days, I ran around with a video camera, blah, blah, blah. And when we were leaving, we actually got detained by Hamas. They took us into the room, like how we went into the country. They said, we can put you up in front of a firing squad. We have the right, legal right to do that. You're stuck into our country. That's what we might be Israeli spies or something, you know? And it made me chuckle. I thought, wow, getting shot at a firing squad by Hamas. What are the chances? What are the chances? My life was worth living. <laughs> That's how I felt about it. So, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm just a freaking nobody. I didn't even finish my school. You know, so that's, that's what I mean. I'm a perfect living example that you don't have to be somebody to make a difference. I've reached millions of people just by talking, just by being honest, and just by wearing my heart on my sleeve and saying what I really feel. And not trying to sell them shit, it's just being me and saying, you know, what, what's all this about? Well, it's about freedom. Freedom, that's all that it's about. That's all it's ever been about. And we have an opportunity for that because the whole veil is laid bare. Everything is laid bare. You can see the system for exactly what it is now. You're prepared to slaughter 2.3 million people, including a million people live on TV while you're all cheering on. You ever think we can see the system for what it is now? What an opportunity, what an opportunity for change. You know, all we've got to do is believe in ourselves and we can do this. We got this. That's what we came here to do. Perhaps this is the being test. So I think this is just the exam, folks. This whole thing is just the exam. It's what comes after that's the important part. You know, and I'm going to go afraid of it, afraid of dying. It's what you're going to do anyway, it's what you came here to do. <laughs> You know, it's unavoidable. Sorry about that. You know? <laughs> so it's what energy you're in. What are you going to do with this information? What, what, what was your life about? What was the real purpose of you being here? Perhaps the purpose was to really look around and to participate in this world. Because we don't really participate. We observe. We consume. We don't really participate because we set ourselves short. We don't think we're worth anything. We're worth everything. We are everything. You know, we created this whole mess through our non-participation. Now we have an opportunity to do something other than that, I think. I think it's important. I really think it's important that we do. So I just want to share that with you folks. I think we're at a real turning point in history and we have an opportunity to save not only our soul, but the collective soul of this whole human experience. We have an opportunity here to turn this world into everything we ever wanted it to be. We can't be scared of it, and it's just going to get worse and worse. That's why it's got to the point now, because we saw all these atrocities. We saw it for years, for decades. We saw all this shit going on in front of us. Now it's got to the point they're going to slaughter all these kids live on TV. What are we going to do about it, you know? I think we can stand up, I think we can make a difference. So it isn't a matter of protesting and stuff, it's a matter of dismissing the government. They're in battle. They're in battle. Just say no to everything they say, rally the people and explain it to them. Talk to your friends. Even if you just can reach one person, one person here can talk to like six or seven people, and you get one or two of them to understand, and then they go around and talk to six or seven people, and one or two of them understand, before you know it. We're a force that is millions and millions strong. And a lot of people will listen if you're just prepared to talk to them in the right way. We can save these kids, we can save these lives, we can save ourselves if we do this. Now's the time, but it's so important, it's so important. 
And I'll tell you folks, when I went to Palestine, they are the kindest, most gentle, most beautiful people you'll ever meet. They really are. That's why they are choosing these people to slaughter. And all the horrible stuff they're saying that they did, they pulled out their eyes and they cut their heads off and did. This is what they intend to do to them. They're not just going to slaughter these people, they're not just going to kill them. They're going to go and they're going to brutalize these people in unimaginable ways because that's what Bolsheviks do. People yeah. have got to understand everything is so backwards. Everything is so backwards. I mean, and I've always been kind of edgy with Israel. I don't want to blame all the Jews. I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. I'll tell you right now Israel, I want to know Israel is the most evil force that exists on this earth. And Benjamin Netanyahu is one of the most evil men in all of history. Yeah. And we need to identify that and we need to stop what's happening. Just the fact that our politicians are supporting this renders them invalid. Yeah. Through an abuse of the office that they hold and they can all be removed under their own law. It's just that we are the ones who have to do it. So it's time to step up to the plate, folks. And I just want to leave you with that. So thanks for listening.